Welcome to Astro Talk and a new episode in our series, Traditional Astrology. Today with a very, very, very special guest in Lisbon, Portugal, Dr. Luis Ribeiro. Do I say Luis or Luis? Luis, you're here. Luis, Luis. Luis, Luis yeah. is a very famous researcher in astrology and he is the headmaster of an astrology school and balancing these two parts of his life is uh, a little bit um, a task. So could we could we start with that? Um, I start with a computer to show our viewers what they can find about the background of, um, okay, I have to get rid of the, this is difficult now this, okay, I, I take them all off so we can, Okay, now I go back. Okay, I, I prepared something for this talk. Now you, we start with a new internet site. It's called Traditional Astrology, Traditional Astrology. The address is tradition.vonabisv.de and there is a subsite called Dr. Luis Ribeiro Portugal. And we will use this link later on in the uh, talk. And um, I start with a context background with this film list. Now, I don't think it's a good idea to repeat what's already on the internet. Mm -hmm. So we have a very interesting more than two hours talk Luis was doing with the Oraculous podcast about techniques in traditional astrology. Then we have three hours and 10 minutes when um, his um, Helen Avila and Luis Ribeiro were on the Astrological Podcast with Chris Brennan. And there you get all the background, how these two people in Portugal studied psychological astrology and then changed to uh, traditional astrology more than three hours. And then we have nearly four hours after um, Elena died unexpectedly in 2021. Um, Luis is talking with Chris Brennan for a very, very long time. So all you need as information you can find here. And I myself had an, a long talk, one and a half hours with Elena in 2020. So uh, then there is a video about Robert Solle. So it doesn't make any sense to repeat all that. Mm -hmm. So I would think um, we start with um, the book on the heavenly spheres. Now, I recall listening to all these videos. It's unbelievable an amount of time if you watch them all, but it was very, very informing. The heavenly spheres um, in the Portuguese or original, it was treatise on the spheres, right? In 2000. Exactly. And, yeah. you pro and you produced this in the years 2004 to 2007. Now, my question, um, this this talk today is more like a question and answer session based on all those videos, because I don't want to repeat that stuff. In, in one of your videos with Chris Brennan, you said you are in the process of re-editing and rewriting the, the book. Is that a, a major re uh, overhauling or is it just bits and pieces? Well... <laughs> It's in pieces, I think. Um, it perhaps include materials that we didn't have time to include at the beginning. New research has come up, and we're always reviewing and revising our own knowledge. So perhaps uh, certain revisions should be made to, to parts, but nothing that would change the overall structure of the book. So basically, um, um, it's the, the same book with a little bit more uh, footnotes. Yeah. Okay, now let's go back to the to the computer. Um, this is really unnerving, but I will get it back. So, okay, here we are. Now, on the first edition of the journal, the tradition, you had an article about temperament do you remember that yes i do and i will start with some questions on what is said about your biography which was rather intriguing for me it says mm -hmm. here um 
Luis has studied astrology since 1991 and works with traditional astrology, having the AMA diploma from Robert Zoller. We come back to that later. His astrology studies also include contemporary astrology, esoteric astrology, and the Hoover method. Now that is that is really intriguing because um, I I got my first education in astrology in esoteric astrology by Nicolas Klein, a German uh, astrologer. Mm -hmm. And when you when you write in that article about your biography, esoteric astrology, which esoteric astrology do you mean by that? Well, basically, Alice Bailey version. Oh, of you, you, you are a pupil of Alice Bailey's astrology like uh, Roberto Asaccioli was the, the, with the psychosynthesis. Yeah, yeah, to a certain way. I, I, I studied that a lot. Uh, I studied that system quite well. Uh, and that's why you went to the Huber School, because the Hubers were Bailey people too and were representative of, of the Bailey School in Geneva and later in Florence with, with Asaccioli. I I attended some some um, workshops with Louisa Huber when Bruno was in the process of um, getting ill. I was wondering, you are no longer a Huber student, right? And uh, you, you no longer no, practice no. astrology in the Huber method. No, no, and mm -hmm. I and I studied it um, not in depth. You know, I, I oh, studied it. I okay. I I, I tested some of its um, okay practices but i didn't study it fully you know i don't i'm not oh. i don't have a diploma or any sort yeah, of okay. um, and you thing. you were a student in one of the two uh, larger astrological schools in portugal in those 90 1990 years um can you elaborate a little bit about these two schools okay so basically in portugal we had two schools we had one one that was called the chiron center which was probably one of the largest. Uh, it when was you headed... say when you say largest, uh, are we talking about a hundred uh, pupils per semester, or are you talking about twenty pupils a semester? What's what's large? A hundred, a hundred or more. Oh, that was really large. It was okay. large. Yes, okay. um, especially because the um, the owner and uh, the director of the school, uh, Maria Flavia Monserrat, who passed away some years ago uh she was very um very well known and and had a very strong personality so she she attracted a lot of people with her with her approach to astrology okay. um, yeah so then she she gathered the result the the, the center had been the result of a um, a gathering of a couple of astrologers in portugal who decided to fund it but the main person who always had at that center was this this um, this woman, um, and she was you know the one that set up the beat uh, for the center. Um, the other one was um, by Paul Cardoso, who who is still an active astrologer here in Portugal, which was a more is more mediatic astrologer, you know, appearing more on TV and and on media. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so he also had a That's course like, running in Germany. That would be Algaio in, in in Germany, probably. Okay. Mm. Uh, and and this second school, how how big or how large were the courses there? Well, I'm not. It wasn't as large as as the other, but still oh, okay. still had a fair amount of students. I would so, say at least thirty per year. So my next question is: In Germany, we have um, uh, an organization called Deutsche Astrologenverband. In English, that's German uh, Association of German Astrologers. Um, did something like that exist in the nineteen nineties in Portugal? No, no. So this was the, these schools were basically the the professional representation of astrology in Portugal. Exactly. Did that exactly. change, or is it still the case that you don't have a, a special association like the American Foundation for Astrologers or something like that? Is there something like that in a, a Portugal? There, there is one now. I think the, the, there is one now, but I'm not oh. connected to them. So, and you are not a member of it. No. Okay. Uh, jumping into the traditional astrology, what would you guess? You yourself are a traditional astrologer. You are consult. You are doing charts with clients. You teach as a headmaster of a school. We come to that later. Are you the only traditional astrologer in Portugal? Mm, presently, I don't think so. 
I think there are more. Uh... But you don't know them? No. There's no network of as Portuguese traditional? No, no, not really. Oh, okay. uh, most of them came from, from my school, you know, so the ones that mm -hmm. are practicing, I know them because they were my, my students. Oh, uh, so you, it's your it's your legacy of, of pupils uh, yeah. having the diploma of your school. Now let's go to your school and, and um, go to, into that subject. Mm -hmm. um, the the school we find the school here okay academy that's another home page I created recently and here is the academy for astrology EU mm -hmm. and as I did with Sue Ward Let's dive into your headmaster function. First of all, headmaster is a title. Do you have secretaries, teachers, um, other people helping you, or is it basically your school and well, you are doing all the work? Yeah, well, I do all the, all the work, basically. Um, it's not... Um... It's not a large organization. It's a very homemade thing. Uh, while Elena was alive, we both run it. We do have two former students who are now um, professional astrologers who help from uh, in some of the functions and and do some of the work as well. Um, one of them was, uh, until very recently, uh, was the one who tutored the uh, online, the correspondence course which now shift for an online course. So it's a bit oh, different. Okay. Uh, they both give uh, some classes, uh, additional classes, some practical sessions, but um, I am at this point the main. So basically we're talking about three teachers, any secretary around or is, is that no. done by the teachers? Okay. <laughs> That's done by us. <laughs> but booking and accounting and all that is done by these three people. Yeah, and yeah. when I did my 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 video with Stephen Birchfield from Norway about his traditional astrology course, we, we went into all the creating process. How did Elena and yourself create this course? Um, was there was, I remember in one video, she talked about your pedagogy pedagogic skills which you had um, gotten in university when you studied geology is that right yeah uh, i had um i had for some time uh went into the the teachers um line of, of course you know so so okay. i had all, all of that training in, in pedagogy and um didactics I all of that so i applied some of that knowledge to to building up the course as well and she she mentioned that you have a very special method system strategy of teaching which is different from other people could you elaborate on that well um basically we try to i think most of the teaching done nowadays pays a lot of attention on um being exhaustive in the meaning of signs, the meaning of planets, the meaning of houses. And they spend a lot of time in that, uh, which I think it's a uh, a legacy that we'll, he'll, we'll have to face for a long, long time of the cookbook astrology that pop up in the, in the 20th century. Uh, so people still do a lot of cookbook astrology in any case. And we decided to get rid of that altogether. So we teach the person to think we just give the basic methods and give you know the the the, met, the structure in which you have to reason to, to achieve an interpretation an astrological interpretation um otherwise most of the methods and i've seen that from students and now with the the school being in english for some years now uh i have uh, students from who have done other courses and the main problem is um, they are taught um, in, a, in a very cookbook way still. So are we talking about the craft of synthesizing the factors of the child? Not really, because you only need a synthesis if you if you got all over the place, you know, if you got randomly uh, stuff and then you need a, a synthesis. Okay. If you go, 
straightforward with a methodology of delineation. You don't need a synthesis because you're doing it already from the start. So you are saying we don't do synthesizing, we do our method, and our method starts at a certain point, goes straight to the heart of the chart. What is the first step? The ascendant, as always. Okay. Uh, in my education with Nicolas Klein in esoteric astrology, he basically said for 80% of the person sitting next to you when delineating the chart, you need the ascendant, the moon, the sun, and the midheaven. And that's 80% of the personality. Would you agree with that? Mm, not really. I would say that the ascendant and all that's connected with it's 50% or more of the chart. Okay. Because you then have connections with okay. the ascendant ruler with other okay. planets. Okay. So I would say 50 to 80% is the ascendant and what goes around And all it. what goes with the ascendant. Exactly. Rulership and, and, and aspects. Yeah. And, and Aspects, planets. And terms and, 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 yeah. and faces and, and uh, all, the, all yeah. the tools of tradition. Yeah, because then if you did that properly and added also the... Um, the mentality, so that the uh, deep study of the moon and Mercury, you, you get the personality. And the personality okay. is what drives the chart to act. The rest is circumstantial things. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you if you talk about ascendant, you're naturally talking about temperament as well, right? Yeah. So your article on the first edition of this uh, journal, uh, translation, which is uh, free, available, and online on uh, the links on my homepage, thanks to Chris Brennan and the Astrology Podcast. Um, when does the temperament come into your starting point? I look at the Ascendant, right from the start or later on? Well, from the start, because the, the temperament assumes that you've already done that, okay. um, that assessment before you start with the chart. Okay, now I come to a problem. I take again to the... I was, when I was um, confronted with a very good book, the dissertation PhD of Elena, um, about this French um, astrologer, mm -hmm. the interesting thing for me was, I was wondering, is there anything comparable nowadays? Does any astrologer today has published a book mm -hmm. about... Um, Let's see whether we can find. Um, okay, this is uh, another. Yeah, this is this. Elena was was analyzing in a in a scientific academic uh, surrounding a French astrologer, mm -hmm. and especially in the today's practice of traditional astrology. I don't remember having seen any book. It's not in Chris Brennan, I believe. It's not in uh, Demetra George. It's not in your heavenly spheres as well in your course book where a single chart is delineated in full. Is my impression correct? Yeah, you probably, you probably are. I don't, I have never seen anyone doing that. How do hmm. you explain that? Because isn't it important for the public as a general and especially for the astrological community who is not traditional, to get an inside look at how does that work? How does a traditional astrologer delineate a client's chart? First question, how long does it take you if you are with a client to delineate the whole chart? I rarely do that. Oh. I rarely go to the whole chart. Okay. Uh, usually a consultation is surrounding, you know, I don't know, half a dozen topics that are of interest uh, to the individual okay. at that point. Okay, so so you never did uh, a chart reading. Um, what is that person? And what is her future? This general approach, you never did that? Well, I, I do. I do that. Um, okay. I don't do it as exhaustive, for example. If you if you look at, at um, the, the chart, the few chart examples we have um, in that regard, um, which I think one of the most known ones perhaps is the, the merchant from William Lilly, where yes. he has yes. the whole thing. Um, that is okay as an example for, uh, um, for a student, but 
in practice, you're not going to go through all those topics with your client because, mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, they talk about brothers, uh, they go through all the houses, so they talk about brothers, they talk about death, they talk about travels. So there, there are some topics that might not pop up, you know, for example, travel related to the ninth house. It's not always a topic that comes up. Um, um, religion, it's a topic that doesn't always um, is there as, as a main thing. Um, so you def, definitely not. Um, I don't think uh, people have the mindset nowadays to be talking about death and and the consequences of death i don't think that's a that's useful or or um except your old teacher robert zola yeah but yeah, okay. robert had his own something <laughs> 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 but i don't think it's useful because most yeah. people i would say 90 99% of people deal very badly with that information so it's not uh, yeah okay okay Why and it, and it's interesting enough in the german uh, uh, organization there was a time when it was forbidden for mm -hmm. the members now it's a little bit less strict but still it's it's a hot topic not to do it okay i understand your approach now your normal your normal reading of a child with a client how long one and a half hours two hours is that normal yeah yeah what does that cost currently 80 euros you're kidding no. 80 euros you do realize that 90 minutes reading in Germany is 150, 250 euros. Yeah, I know. I know. And I saw I have I have people that I know that charge more uh, a lot more, but um I think um well I always adjusted the price uh, to the okay. Portuguese reality, you know. I'm not uh, going to charge a hundred for an astrological reading is a bit too much. For okay. a Portugal basic standard, uh, because so not... of because of the society and the economy and people exactly. don't, don't spend that and, money. Okay, and um, I could have thought of raising prices for uh, non Portuguese, uh, yeah. but I don't think it's fair. Okay. You know? okay, now that that's intriguing because I started yesterday a project. Uh, I'm asking for English speaking people like you, like you, you speak English. I'm started a project to delineate a chart in total with 180 minutes, more or less, to demonstrate the the craft of the concrete traditional astrology not who is not allowed to use the outer planets. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started that project yesterday and, and sent some emails out. I, I didn't send you an email because we were talking today. And the idea is that somebody who's, who, who is practicing astrology traditionally, like you, and doing it publicly, on my channel, either with a historic figure or with me or with me myself. So first question, I know that you are very sensible about privacy aspects, yourself and your clients. If somebody like me would be willing to pay these 80 euros or 120 euros for 180 minutes publicly, and you're looking at my chart, would you do that? What I'm wa wa waving me all the, the legal aspects of privacy for demonstration purposes. Mm. You, you see, um, some people record their their, their consultations. Yeah. Yeah, but that's privately. This would be publicly. Publicly. I'm not too keen on doing that. I Again, thought so. For I privacy. thought so because I, what I saw in the other videos, I thought that you might be a little reluctant to go into public uh delineation why yeah. why is i've that? done that for classes yeah okay and i do that on classes all the time yeah. I, well, that's I've done normal. That. that's normal yeah. i've done that on lectures yeah okay but publicly i don't so there's a difference between the pupil of robert zola and robert zola himself who said oh, yeah. he, he always did that he, oh, even, yeah. he even went as far. I remember one video with Chris Brennan in, 20, in, in, in 2011 when he said in the audio podcast, I say it straight. And in one case, the, the, the person who was delineated said, no, that's not true. And Robert Sola said, you're lying. And later on, it turned out he was right. The person was lying. Yeah, but, but there you are. You see, um, when I'm doing things in public, um, from 
from other people's charts if they're present um i tend to be careful not to um embarrass okay. the person I understand. In, any, in any aspect you are not you know? robert solo obviously i'm not know. robert solo then i don't agree with it, what he did you know okay yeah. um because he might be wrong and that's a bit yeah. a bit yeah. of okay. ubris you know I okay. know. And it, it happens. Sometimes people lie. It's true in, in the sense that people say no to things because they don't want to admit it and they're, they're entitled to it. And the setting of publicly. Yeah. You know, publicly even more. You know, you know yeah. I'm talking even in private. Privately, sometimes people don't want to admit certain things. And then as the, the conversation progresses and the person gains a bit more trust, it, he or she might confess, you know, okay, yeah, what, what you said about this late early on it's true in some aspect and, and then the person explain uh, explains but publicly i'm very careful you know okay. and i don't i don't i'm not and i'm not at all a proponent of um publicly showing your chart always being delineating students charts i don't like it you know yeah, I, know, I, I know you said that in the videos okay <laughs> second proposition how about a historical figure you wouldn't have those problems with Goethe or Schiller or Rudolf Steiner or people like that. Or no, CEO. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Would, would you do it to demonstrate the craft? Yeah, if I had the time to prepare it, yes. Okay, so let's keep that in mind that you might be willing. I pay you over 120 euros and we do that in a, a special session. Okay, um, back to the 90s. You started your astrological education. The school you went to, the Kaiwan school, what approach was that? Was that uh, Liz Green and and and, and Ratya, or was there something else? Well, it was a big. Well, it's a, the usual modern mix, you know. It had um, all of the psychological aspects. It had um, a lot of spiritual astrology and karmic astrology and stuff like that. Um, at the beginning, it was very french inspired you know it had all that karmic uh astrology that comes mainly from from france also with andre barbeau from france a little bit not so much a bit later oh, i think okay. a bit later than under barbeau okay. um but it had a lot of a lot of things and it there were several teachers and each had their own approach okay. But okay. basically, modern psychological astrology. And that time frame was, I think, you you studied at that school from nineteen ninety five to nineteen ninety nine, something like that. Something like that, yes. And Absolutely. that is that is a time frame where Project Hindsight was already around for three years mm -hmm. and longer. Um, did you hear about that in your school at all? No. No information. What's going on in America? The same question about England, uh, Olivia Barclay, was she ever mentioned in your school? No, 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 no. Traditional astrology was something that didn't out, exist. Out, didn't exist. Okay. Didn't exist. 1999, and then a couple of years later, now there's a transition process. How did the impetus reach you? Was it your guardian angel or something else <laughs> that you had the feeling... I want to go into traditional astrology. There must have been something. If you haven't heard of it in your school teaching, how did you hear or learn about the existence of traditional astrology? Well, um, let me try to rethink those dates. So by 99, it was the first time Elena and I started to teach. Yes. So I would have ended my that course three years or more because that course was was quick um it was three years or something so and i did it very quickly um we started to well elena had some older uh, books because in spain they have been translating from the latin and from the arabic uh much before any hindsight project you know you have things you're talking about the, the the group about ali ben rachel abin ben rachel uh al bubater um masala okay. they have a lot they had already a lot of translations done i think most from latin some from uh from arabic um and that were circulating already so elena had some of those books i have already had the, the chance of of uh of seeing them from time to time and i went to to a conference in um in spain 
where I got some some of that material as well. So it was on long, uh, around, and one of the astrologers we 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 met here. Uh, he was our friend, and he had all of that of the project okay. hindsight. He had the mm -hmm. all that material. So we started also to to be aware that that existed because Portugal was very close in terms of of um, communication with uh, any other uh, outside. Um, astrologers or institutions since we didn't have we did not have an institution um for astrology so there was very few communication uh so we i started to have contact with that and so, and then i took zoller's introduction course with elena and i both did the okay the... okay now, now let's get very 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 slow this is most intriguing to take Zolo's certificate course at first, I suppose. Yeah. How did you and by whom did you learn about his existence? I think it was from Sue Ward at first. So I think. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So, so Sue Ward comes first and Zolo comes later? I think so. Okay. I think so. We got in contact with Sue. Uh, yeah, around the 2000s, and then Zoller right afterwards, I think through Sue Ward, or something like that, or more, more or less at the same time, okay. they would still have that, while they were starting that new library. Uh, so I renew my project. question. To know that a person like Sue Ward existed is not natural for a Portuguese astrologer. How did you mm. find out well, about Sue Ward? Through the internet, and a friend of ours had oh. contacted her. Okay. Um, because at the time, we, the internet was already, you know, uh, moving along. So, our contact with what's happening outside was from the yeah, internet. Yeah, that's that's the same time when the internet got got off his feet and and it exactly. was more available. Yeah, and then we had a lot of internet stuff going around. So we basically met people through the internet, and we were already interested in a lot of traditional stuff by then. Um, okay. And the core this course comes up and we decided well let's start let's get some basics yeah but but sue ward has a course by her own about ovary astrology did you take that course i didn't elena did and how much was that to pay how how expensive was that in those days do you remember that i don't know i don't recall okay so basically elena it wasn't cheap yeah, from a Portuguese that's point what, of view. That, that, that's what I th I'm thinking. Um, so basically, Elena is diving into Sue Ward's astrology, all worry. You learned that later, I suppose, because you're doing yeah. it nowadays. And you sort of got the idea there is a guy like Robert Zoller. You contacted him, you booked his course, and that was expensive, very much expensive, yeah. for the certificate course. And now we go to the computer to talk about Robert Zoller. Okay, Robert Zoller. What can you tell us about your first? Was what did you what? When did you get the first, the first personal impression of the person? Uh, to book an online course is something. Was it was it videos or was it uh, was it uh, written material? It was written material at the time, and okay. there were some audio files. Audio we, files. We were still a bit before videos. Um, okay. So it was audio files. He had a couple of lectures on audio, if okay. I recall correctly. Okay. And we got the PDFs of the uh, okay. of the materials, and we would read it. We so basically, see. the personality of Robert Zoller did couldn't interfere negatively or positively with your learning process because you didn't have any personal contact in the beginning. Yeah. At the beginning, we then invited him to come to Portugal and do some. Now so, that is that is intriguing because Robert Zoller is not a normal person. Would you agree? <laughs> he has his very own special friend. <laughs> <laughs> now Robert Zoller coming to Lisbon. What was your first impression? Well, he was nice. He was uh, very um, accessible. You know, it was okay. Why did um, why did he, why did he do that? I mean, that's a long journey from America to Portugal I for think... these two guys in in Lisbon. I think at at the time he was in Europe, oh, he was okay. in England, so we oh. took advantage of that. Okay. okay, and told him if he wouldn't mind stopping by Portugal and and uh, giving a lecture. Yeah. 
uh, we already had Sue Ward at the time, I think. Sue Ward uh, gave a gave an orary, a short orary course introduction at that period. And then uh, Robert Zoller came and he gave a few workshops. Um, and how, did, how, did, how did you experience his workshops? Uh, was it as uh, blunt and direct and without any uh, taking prisoners? Was that your own experience as well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was very to the point, but we we have to we have to remind ourselves that he was at the point trying to put forward a traditional astrology. Yes, he and, was a, mission, a missionary. Yeah, and nowadays is relatively easy to speak about traditional astrology yes, yes. without getting stoned, uh, but yes. at the time, it was not. At the time, the community, the astrological community, was very aggressive towards anyone practicing traditional astrology. Nowadays, they don't admit it because it's all peace and love as yeah. usual, but they were very aggressive and they were very criti critical of traditional astrology to the point of breaking friendships, breaking contact with people, not inviting certain... So he, he was fighting against that. So some of that bluntness is explained by character. That was how he was. But there's also... We also have to... Be, have in mind that he was fighting against a contrary response because all the psychological astrologers at the, the period were uphold or and offended by that kind of practice being yeah. reinstated and reappearing again in tradition. So there was a lot of backlash. Um, so we can't ignore that. So that can also explain, you know, the rudeness and the bluntness, which you will find, for example, in the early writings of John Frawley. His yes. first book is quite yes. criticized and he jokes and he, he plays around with it and provokes. It's the same thing. You know, he's fighting um, the, the, the system, you know, which is enclosed in that modern psychological perspective. Um, so that explains also a bit... Um, the way that they approach things. And of course, their personalities, because we have other people who simply did the work the best they could, presented solid stuff and were not as argumentative. You're thinking of people like Robert Hand, for example. Sorry, like? Robert Hand would be this, what you just mentioned, normal normal approach. No, well, perhaps. So I'm thinking about also Sue Ward, Sue who's Ward, always yes. produced. yes. A lot of material, yes, but yes. it's but she's not, yeah, as... she's, she's not as aggressive as, as Robert Sola, that's true, exactly. Um, did you Robert Hand was always Robert, uh, Robert Hand, I think, always worked within the system, yes. So he had one foot in tradition and one foot in, um, yeah, okay. Did yeah. you ever meet John Frawley personally? No, no, no okay. Now let's um, let's come to the conference in Amsterdam in 2004. Who gave you the idea to go there? Was that Robert Zoller? Because he it was, was a, Robert Zoller. Yes, he yes. gave you the idea. Come to Amsterdam. It's a nice conference. Well, he and then and then and then you had this. Uh, well, from your academic perspective of today, being an historian yourself now, but not having been an historian then, could we split that in two questions? How did you experience him as an astrologer attending that conference in 2004? And how do you view the experience with Robert Zoller and the problems arising of his presentation from your academic perspective as of today? That's probably a different kind of looking at things, right? Okay, okay. Let's see if I can, if I can reply to you with the whole thing. So from my perspective, back then we had just finished publishing um which was our second book at the time elena and i which was a, a research onto the charts of portuguese kings yes so, i know i know that yeah yeah we went to to all the, the the archives we could find so we had our one of our first approaches to archival uh work so on you history. were with one foot already in the water of exactly. academic academic exactly. uh, um, um, yeah. peer-reviewed quality not officially yet because it yeah. was uh, we were starting to research not only uh, these this aspect of the kings and and you have to see old documentation but also the um 
also the um, oh, sorry and uh, we're also working for looking for astrological texts of, yes. of portuguese origin at that period and it was when elena started her history degree more or less at at the same time it was around 24 um and then um when Robert mentioned that he was going to this conference, we looked at it and decided, well, at least one of us should go. Do you and remember? Do you remember? Was it an, uh, a conference organized by the University of Amsterdam with Professor Bauter Hanegraaf and Koko von Stuckrad, or was it something else? It was by Koko von Stuckrad. But he was assistant professor in 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 the chair of of uh, Western esotericism, Western Hermetic, yeah. and related currents. Uh, so it, it it you you don't remember who was the, the the main responsible background? Was it the University of Amsterdam? It was the University of Amsterdam. So it must be Hanegraaf then. Okay, good. Okay, so Could you be. went there. I don't recall who was the the chief, uh, the, the 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 one who's the headed that, but um. No, oh, that's that's Hanegraaf. Hanegraaf became professor in 1999 of this new found this this this. There was a sponsoring sponsoring by a private the person who sponsored the money for the exactly. new chair, Western Hermit, Hermetic and re related currents. He is uh, now emeritus, I believe. Um, and Coco von Stuttgart was assistant professor. So it was this this background. Okay, now you came to Amsterdam by, by, by plane, I suppose. Sorry? Did you go by, by, by aeroplane or by train? Aeroplane. Okay, you, you scrape all Amsterdam, you go into the city, you find your accommodation, you go to the conference. What did you experience? Well, it was um, one of the best experience I had in terms of of, um, of realizing how important it was to make um, history of astrology. Because you know, the, the title of the conference was Horoscopes and History. Horoscopes and History. That and was we've the just, original We've just published, you know, a, a collection of, well, not historical horoscopes because they were not... Um, they were not the originals. We'd only found one original at the time. Um, but it was on historical figures so yeah. um it was very interesting to to have contact with all those scholars and we had everyone there at the time you know we the had big the ones. Creme, de, creme de la creme the the the, the, the conference yeah. published as a book we come later to the book where the people can read it okay so it was it was uh very special for you yes and how how was how was the energy it was good. I think all of it was very interesting. And, you know, I came from from um, a science uh, perspective. So so uh, I was educated in chemistry. I was educated in geology. So hard science, natural science, not, you know. So I was, I was uh, very okay with the, the objectivity of the things. And I think most of them were very objective in the way that they were uh, they were presenting presenting very interesting facts, very interesting materials, um, which inspired me, let's say, um, to to pursue then that that line of work, um, and the whole energy was good. We did have that incident with um, Robert Zoll, the historical <laughs> incident with Robert Zoll's presentation. Did you did uh, you experience it more or less the same as you would look at it today, or was there a different approach when you were there? Well, I I, I knew him personally, so I was. That's uh, what I mean. Of, that's what I was. I was, was a bit upset for how, him, but how he was treated. Well. I must say, and I don't, I don't think people tell this story quite often. But unfortunately, he was he was at its own fault of the way he was treated because his topic. There were several problems with his presentation. The first one is you don't, you cannot talk about um, practical astrological subjects in an historical scientific conference it, it's two different universes so you cannot assume that the people you are talking to are going like in a normal astrological conference except that astrology works so you will discuss it historically and his claim in his paper was that you could use astrology predictive astrology to uncover unknown 
facts about the lives of historical figures. So what you do, you would pick up a, story, a historical figure, you would delineate the chart, and then you would say, oh, this person did this at this age and had that problem at this age, even if you don't have the equivalent historical documentation. And that can only be achieved and accepted if you accept astrology as something that really works. And the academic world does not accept astrology as something that works. You can study it as an historical practice, but not as an actual practice. And that's where he had this problem. That was his first problem. He made a claim that could not be verified or accepted by normal academia. If he did that conference in a in an astrological conference, that would be perfectly okay, but not at, the, at that level. So immediately, there were some academics that backlashed against him. He could not do that claim. And that's where it became a bit more aggressive. The other problem was that he had, I don't know, I don't recall the numbers. Was, let's say he had 30 minutes to do his presentation or 40 minutes. I don't recall exactly. And he had prepared an hour and a half long exposition. So he didn't have the time to do the whole thing. I don't know if he thought he was a keynote lecture or something like that. I don't understand what happened there. But the fact that he had, he, he was going to surpass greatly his, his allotted time to talk and they had to stop him like they would any other yes. person, you know, yeah. the, the independently of the rank, you know, you have an hour to talk or 40 minutes or half an hour and you, you just have that. If you didn't finish, you had to stop. And that yeah. was, was happening. He was very upset about that. Um, so in a sense, he got himself into that trouble. And at the time, I remember watching him present this and watching the reactions. And I remember commenting with, with um, some friends and some people I knew there. He couldn't bring, it, it, it is not the place to, to bring that kind of claim. I think that's an important information for other people. Uh, if yeah. they cross over to the academics field, how to present uh, astrology as a, as a topic. When, the, when this had happened, did you sit with him after it with James James uh, James Holden was there too? Did you three sit together and discuss what had happened? Well, a little bit, but I think he oh. was too upset to discuss oh. it for, so for quite a while. Basically, he was he was rather I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now coming back to his personality in the in the video in, in the uh, audio podcast with Chris Brennan of 2011, he indicated he didn't talk about it. He indicated that um, his interest had shifted to hermetic aspects and to Kabbalah aspects. Yeah. That was late later, probably. Uh, how long did you keep contact with Robert Zola, you yourself? Well, <clears throat> I think until 2005, five, six. Or oh, not very long then. No, not very long. Not very long. So, um, did, did in this period where you have a, a direct impression, did he ever talk in your, the contacts he had with you personally about these spiritual aspects that he is going on a hermetic path and a kabbalistic path? Very, very lightly. Oh, okay. Very lightly. Okay. So now we go back to the creating of the journal. Who had the idea of creating? We are now on the astrotalk.fonavisweb.de with, with uh, Luis Ribeiro. And who had the idea to edit a journal? It's a lot of information for context, what we are doing today. So I have to find my way myself. <laughs> um, it was edited in the end by Sue Ward, Helena Avila, and yourself. Yeah, and Peter Stockinger as well. Oh, Peter Stockinger was involved as well. Oh, yes. oh that, yes. now I'm getting there and there. Okay, it's here. Okay, the traditional journal of Western predictive astrology. Um, okay, Peter Stockinger is new on the picture. 
did you meet Peter Stockinger because of Suvo? Because the two of the two of them worked together? Exactly, exactly. Uh, so, um, so we met him to Suward. Elaine and I had that idea, I think, uh, and then we talked with Suward, and we chatted and, and sort of brainstormed uh, the journal into existence. And Peter Stockinger was involved as well. Um, because he was he was always a very competent at writing and and and, and structuring things, so uh, we four did the 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 journal and tried did he to... ever did he ever tell you why he left Austria, where he is original from, and why he never got uh, went back? No, 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 I... he didn't talk about it. Okay, no, Peter no, no. Stockinger is there, and the four of you create this journal, and it's publicly available. And it's very good. And I printed the, the the material out for myself. It's very interesting and intriguing articles. It's probably the best journal on traditional astrology ever ever published in the 20, 21st century up to now, and in the twentieth century. Um, you had to discontinue it because of your academic interests. We come to that later. Yeah. Um, why didn't Suward and Stockinger continue the job? No, it was too much work. <clears throat> oh, okay. Or, or just you know, two people. Yeah. And at the time, I think that the, the the one of the problems with the journal was that it was ahead of its time. So we didn't had the that that many traditionalists able to produce material for the the journal oh that's another story then okay. which is always you know the once you publish the a magazine a journal whatever the the problem is always content you know getting yes. content yes. good yes. quality content because we wouldn't accept any kind of content it would have to be very good quality content and at the time the tradition was not that widespread that oh. uh, we would have enough contributors of quality for it and do you so... see do you see in 2023 a comparable uh, publication as a journal is there something in traditional astrology who now picks up the the baton not that i'm aware of not yet no. okay now coming back to your academic career you had been on university a little bit without uh, graduating, I believe, in mm -hmm. geology, but you had pedagogical courses and all that. And then uh, in 2010 or something around that, uh, you went back to university yeah. and you studied uh, history? Art history. Art history, right. It was, that was different. <laughs> Helena was history and you were art history. Yeah, because um, Elena had already done history and I said, well, I'm not going to do history like you because... In a sort of way, I accompany her course, you know. Uh, yes, you have been basically studying the same stuff. Yeah, she was studying at my side, she was yeah. studying it with me. So I, I basically, you know, have a, an honorary <laughs> history degree together yeah. with her. Um, I, had, I had the same experience with my first wife. Um, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer from profession and I was working in the, in the administration in Lower Saxony. And my wife was a, was a doctor and she was studying homeopathy. Mm -hmm. And I I went along. I was allowed to went along, and I got the the whole education, <laughs> like you say, honorary degree. You know, <laughs> homeopathy. I I have I have a I can, I can connect to that. Okay, yeah, yeah. so you decided to do art history. Why art yeah. history? Is that a hobby? Well, I, I at long long time ago, um, I had to decide between um, going to sciences or going to arts, and uh, I opted for sciences at the time when I was very young. So I decided, well, why not go to Art oh, okay. history, it's a top. It it was a field I wasn't, I didn't knew it. I I had never had art history in my in my experience. So I said, why not? Let's see what it goes. And I liked it a lot. I enjoyed when, it. When you studied art history, uh, and coming to the graduation time, was there an artist which was your favorite? No, not really. Not oh. really. Mm. Nothing. I, um, Nothing I. I I like the medieval art a lot, and in the medieval oh, art we have okay. very little names. Yeah, um, okay, okay. So okay. I'm, I'm. Okay, and you're graduating in art history. That's 2014 something. That's 2014. Yes. 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 And then Elena already um, had started with her master master degree with with the, the professor in the University of Lisbon. What was your next step in a master level? What did you do? Well, actually, I was invited to do 
to to go from from the the the, um, the bachelor's degree to the PhD directly. Oh, directly. Yeah, because I had oh. uh, had enough grades for that, and I did that so for a year. So I did the first year the art history PhD, um, but then. Um, the government would not allow people who didn't have a, a, an MA to have access to grants. So I decided, well, I'm not going to pursue this anymore. So I'm going to get back and do uh, the MA properly and have, you know, have the oh. complete set yes, of degrees. Yes, yes. So okay. it will make my, 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 my curriculum more solid. So I went back and tr sort of converted what I was doing um, in the PhD to an MA, um, and got so an it MA was an MA history. in art history, basically. Yes, it was took on you, um, took you two years, I suppose. Two years, yes. So it was on the okay. on the representations of science in medieval uh, manuscripts, basing based on a a document which is the first. Um, text in uh medical text in um in the vernacular language with uh, it is uh, the regiment of the body by aldo brandino of siena okay and i studied the decorated versions of that text this is uh, it's, and you graduated uh, uh, yeah. normally or with high honors well, I oh, I got uh, high honors. So. Okay, so now you have the MA in your pocket, and now you could go for a PhD. But since you got the MA in art history, you might have lost interest in doing a PhD in art history. Was it like that? Not really. Um, in the meantime, uh, I was uh, invited or challenged by by in, in Dr. Enrique Leitao who became my PhD supervisor to work on the, um, the, the the manuscripts we had from the Jesuit order on astrology, which oh. he had he had published a paper. A so that paper. was different. In, in, in Elena's case, it was Elena and yourself uh, having found a manuscript and proposing to do a PhD about the manuscript you had found. In this case, the professor um, suggested to you the theme of your PhD. Yeah. But he suggested because he knew me and Elena, basically. He, yeah. he met Elena yeah. first, and then he knew me as well. And he knew that we had th some of those manuscripts already. Yes. Since the early 2000s, because when we started to research um, the his history of astrology in Portugal, yes. those were some of the manuscripts we had. So yes. we... So I, I decided... He knew that we were aware of them, and we had the uh, um, the proper credentials and knowledge to to really study them in depth. So I I, I accepted his challenge. Uh, and, and this is the final product. Yep. It, it, I found this on the internet. I don't remember where I did find it. Is it yep. is it in book for? Is it in print available? Not yet. Uh, hopefully oh. this year it will come out in print with the revised. And so the... this is a robbery. Uh, they're stealing your product aren't they? <laughs> in the <laughs> Internet. Well, uh, you know, when you get a grant for a PhD, it is mandatory that the PhD is accessible to everyone. Ah, uh, and that is your... Because... So basically people can find this. Now let's talk about the, the thesis. Um what was the initial proposal of your professor, Lithio? Leiton, yes. Leiton. Uh, Leiton. He well, he, he he proposed a study of the of the content of the manuscripts. Uh, manuscripts and, of the Jesuit order with the content of astrology subjects. Well, well, let me let me tell you what exactly it is about. Um, okay. What happens in Portugal, which is a very interesting case, is that. Um, from 1590s up to until the expulsion, the Jesuits uh, operated several colleges here in, in Portugal, as they would uh, in the world. And in particular, this college in Lisbon uh, had the, a, a particular class on mathematics. So it was a course on mathematics, who was accessible, which was accessible to people outside the college. So it was not just an internal thing of the Jesuit college, but something that was accessible to anyone wanting to go. Um, well, anyone here 
limited to <laughs> the time, you know. Um, so they would offer this basic course on mathematics, which was not that basic. Uh, um, it was a pre-universitary uh, course on mathematics, very technical, very practical, in which is included um, astrology. And um, of all the, the manuscripts that survive from that period, and you have classes on algebra, algebra, geometry, astronomy, um, shipbuilding, um, ballistics, you have all uh, physics, mathematics, all of that. And the, the, the most numbers of them are the ones on astrology. So you have several examples, several copies, let's say, of the, the of, of of the astrology courses of several years, and that was considered an oddity, because everyone assumes and wrongly that astrology was forbidden at that period. So how can the Jesuits, which are a religious order, be teaching astrology so so straightforwardly? So I I decided to go into that uh, material and try to understand what was happening, what was the case here. And um, that was 2016 when you started with that. I started it, yeah. And now uh, a personal question. Elena got this Portuguese grant from the government for full full time studying in the Warburg Institute for her PhD. Now that's, that sort of sounds like a long distance relationship. Or did she <laughs> come every weekend home? No, not every weekend, but from time to time. Uh, oh, okay. It was a bit harsh to 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 yeah. be separated from her for for such a long time. Because you were a happy couple. Yeah, we were. Yeah. How did you manage to be a happy couple for more than twenty years? What was your what was your trick? What was your secret? Because many people can't do that. I know. Well, I don't know if um, there is a secret, but. Um, we shared uh, a lot of common knowledge, a lot of common uh, interests, and astrology okay. was one of them. Okay, I won't dig, go go read more in, more into the privacy. Yeah. I know that you are very sensible about that. Um, now you are you are doing this work in in Portugal with this professor at the University of Lisbon. Um, in your PhD, this wasn't a document like the Belly document, the manuscripts of S. Belly. Uh, practicing information. It was a, a, a it was manuscripts about teaching astrology. Yeah. Did you find in those manuscripts and in your PhD um, ap applications like one chart fully applied theory, or was it mainly only theory, manual um, manual of astrology, but not not a course book like you produce for your heavenly spheres? Well, it is a course book of the period. They do give some examples, but not nothing very complex. So and... you would compare it with your own course book on your on your course in the in the Academy of Astrology, in the, uh, where you are the headmaster. Something like in those times, but something like a course book like you produced yourself. Yeah. So oh, it, okay. It is a, an equivalent of the time with a different didactical approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, but, did you um, did you go to the Warburg for your studies or just to visit him? Well, I did, and and I and I I did some some stuff with the Warburg. The Warburg has has the largest, what I think is the largest library on the history of astrology. Yes, and it what's wonderful about the Warburg. Yeah. Uh, now they're remodeling, and I don't know how. If it he is hadn't now. had the Nazis, it would still be in Hamburg. That's that's not not fair. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but the oh, thing is, you're yeah, looking okay. for a paper. Let's say you yeah, go to the catalog yeah, yeah, and you get the okay. paper, and you go okay. to the shelf yourself to collect yeah. it, and you'll see it, and then beside it, because they're ordered by topic, yes. you're going to find articles that you have no idea existed, which are very relevant to what yes. you're studying. Yeah. So, you you can get completely lost in there, you know, within the amount of material. Yeah, that they have. So I had that opportunity, and um, Charles Burnett was my co-supervisor in the the grand seigneur of the history of astrology. Yeah, yeah. I had applied to the Warburg a few years earlier, and I did. I got the acceptance, but unfortunately, I didn't got the grant oh, at okay. the time. So, but I you got know. you got you got a prize award for your dissertation, right? Yes, I for, did for the high quality of it. Can you talk about that prize? 
who, well, who gave you... it? Who, who? What organization is behind this award? Who? Who is? Who is doing that? And why did you get for a very ast astrological, touchy uh, subject the prize by this organization? Who was it, well, and why did you? No, it is it? the University of Lisbon that does that, and. Uh, oh. um, it it's a university. university award. Yeah, it is a university award. So how many they... how many of these awards are around for PhDs? Well, um, not many, not many. So I you like... are a very special award holder yeah. because of your research. Okay. Yeah, because to apply to that award, uh, the it has to be proposed. By the the heads of the departments. By your professor, I suppose. Yeah, and. Um, and they are only accepted uh, PhDs who had a very high level of appraisal yeah. to start with. Yeah. So you need to have a, an honors uh, PhD. To, did you, to did you get to... summa cum laude or something like that? Yeah, I did. I did. Summa cum laude, which is the highest. Well, there is one level beyond that which is never given, but summa cum laude is the highest normal level. Yeah, it's a bit different in Portugal, but it would be the equivalent. Yeah, it, okay. it, it's the highest. And yeah, it's, okay. it's with distinction and honors. I think that's how they... Yeah, they, they, yeah okay. okay. That's the highest... Uh, yeah. Level, yeah. So it and 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 the application comes from your professor, not from yourself. No, it's it's the department. And is there is there money involved? Mm, is there? Yes, yes. Oh, you, you got a, a few euros, but it's the honor basically, which stands it's the honor the basically. It's, yes, it's yeah. not it's not going to be you rich. And it, and it helps to find a publisher, right? Sorry, it helps to find a publisher. It does. Yeah, you know how. You, it does really. Uh, are you are you with Brill or do you have an? I'm idea? with Brill. I'm going You're to with the high, the most high class publisher in in religious science and 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 history of astrology and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I well, I'm I'm applying to publish with them. I'm still waiting for yeah the okay. whole process. To oh, that takes time. Yes. Okay. Now, both of you are high class academic personalities after this process with both the PhDs. And then you started Ad Astra. Mm -hmm. Who had the idea? I don't recall. I would, it's very I would, difficult. I would, I, would, I, would, I would think it was partly Helena who would do that, a thing like that. It's very difficult to say because yeah. We, yeah. We, we, we might have fragments of ideas and yeah, then we start okay. bouncing okay. them between us. And it, 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 it and what, Okay, both of you had the idea. What was the original idea? What 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 popped up in your heads? What, what did your guardian angel tell you in your sleep what you have to do? What was the original starting point? Well, now we know what it's yeah. 76 so, something like interviews. Yeah, Elena, Elena began a, a trend which already existed in the history of astrology, but it's important. And her book is, I think, the first one to truly dedicate themselves to that kind of analysis, which is the study of the technical aspects of astrology. Yes. So instead of just um, doing the, the also important understanding of the... Um, of the social implications, you know, uh, and all of all of the social political implications of astrology, she uh, opted to, although she approached that as well, you, we always have to because things always exist in the context, but what she did was she analyzed what is the technique that is being done here. What is he applying? What are the authors? What are the methodologies being applied for that astrologer's hand. So in the same way, is the, it's the equivalent of in the history of mathematics to study um, how the equations are, are done are done. You know, it's so that's the technical aspect of astrology, how it evolves. That was one also always one of our purposes in studying academically. Um, and she had the, the, the ideal manuscript to do it because she had the workbook of an astrologer, yes. which yeah. are rare documents to find, and a very large one um, with a large collection of horoscopes. So far, the earliest personal collection of horoscopes uh, known. Uh, uh, the uh, earliest uh, of the Renaissance or in total? The earliest of the late Middle Ages, early Renaissance. Okay. You know, I think the earliest known because we, we of course, there would have been others. We know of that, but they haven't survived. Yeah. Okay. 
we don't have the, the the manuscripts. Perhaps one day we can find more. Yes, yeah, yeah. that would be interesting. So that's the earliest known surviving horoscopes uh, with because he has you know uh, important figures. He has personal horoscopes, etc. So she had the the ideal uh, point to do that, and um, and then there was a big conference. Uh, it was in November, October or November. I think it's November of um 2018 there was a big conference at the at the warburg to launch um at the time the translation the charles bonnet and um uh, and he's a translation partner who had the great, the great introduction of abu Mashal, i believe yeah exactly the great introduction of yamamoto okay. um so uh he, they were presenting this and there was a conference made and at the time, Charles Burnett asks us to do a pre, um, a pre uh, conference workshop on the principles of astrology. What would be the principles of, of that an astrologer of that period would have to know? So, just give the audience a basic idea of the astrological principles that the Great Introduction is um, is yeah. introducing. <laughs> So presenting um so we did that and at the time we had this idea why don't we present the project so he created the project very quickly you know the guidelines he was one of our big mentors on that on that uh, process because it was his idea basically yes yeah uh, so yeah. He, he he mentored that that structure and how it could be done and what we accomplished was um a work group an academic work group that studies the techniques of astrology and then we we invited a few more uh, big scholars that uh, i knew that elena knew to be our advisors on the project um and and we launched that at that conference but it's resting on the shoulders of the two of you and now of you alone what happens if you if you drop dead? Is it is it cancelled then, or is somebody there who keeps up the work if if you well, the, can't do it? Well, the project can be done by anyone that um, that can hold it in its shoulders, really, because yeah. it's a non funded project. That's yes, all. that yeah. has been our handicap in terms of producing more stuff. Why because... is why is that? Why why didn't the the high class people like uh, Stefan Heilen and David Juice and Burnett um, sort of organize some funding because they could have done, couldn't they? Mm, it's not that easy. Oh, okay. It's not that easy to to find financing for projects nowadays, oh, okay. uh, especially historical projects and history of astrology. I would think it's not in its in the highest. Um, <laughs> and, the your, highlight. and your own professor, I can't remember his name, Lita. Lita, yeah. Lita, and um, he's emeritus now, right? No, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not How yet. about him? Why? Why couldn't he integrate this into his institute? Well, he did. So the 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 project doesn't exist outside academia. The project exists in the, at the University of Lisbon within oh. the Institute for Research in the History of Science. It so you have you have you have you have a boss for this project. The boss of the project is your professor. Well, I am the head of the project, but there he's, is a, he's a the head boss of the because it's integrated that, into university. Exactly. Uh, okay. So it is a collaboration between the University of Lisbon through the, the Center of uh, Research into the History of Technology of Science, with the uh, the the Warburg, uh, the Warburg Institute, and the uh, IKGF at in the, Erlangen uh, Nuremberg, yeah, Erlangen okay. University. So yeah, it is okay. a collaboration between those projects. So the project is. Had is uh, headed here in Portugal in the University of Lisbon, but it counts with the official collaboration with the with the Warburg and yes. the IKGF. Unfortunately, and the project the project came very um, when it was starting off. We had the COVID, so there wasn't yes. a lot of opportunity to do yes. things, you know. Yeah. And then Elena passed away, yeah. and um, things started to go very slowly. And I, I expect to to revise. To 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 revive the project um, in the next month. Yeah. Okay. Basically, what what the people can see here is this is Charles Burnett. Um, these are all the interviews Elena and you were conducting. Yeah. 
is any important researcher in the field missing or did you get them all not all who is missing well we didn't have a chance to do um van der Broeke, Steven okay. van der Broeke. he could at the time he couldn't um and there are a few more so there's still I'm... some and, and you intend to do these interviews with those people missing yes, yes. and what are you doing when they when you got them all then you well, are... no there are about uh, the podcast um, is was not intended to be a regular thing. It happened because everyone was at home. It was easy to get the interviews, you know. So so that's why we had so many uh, all of a sudden. So that was a, a good aspect of, of the of the confin uh, of being confined at home. But um, some people didn't reply. Some people couldn't at the time. But once I got the main ones... They're always researchers, and I, have, I we have interviewed researchers, so people who are doing their PhDs, who are presenting new research, all of that is interesting. People who wrote, yeah, for yeah. example, interesting papers on a, a topic, and they can come and discuss that. Um, okay. What's your position in the university? You are on the homepage of the university. Uh, are you employed? Or do you get a salary from the university? Not currently, no. Do you intend to go into this uh, career path to become uh, an employee of the academic? Yes, if um, if the opportunity comes, yes. Okay, but Lisbon is a small university, I suppose, in this department, and, and your field is not that big for, how do you say this in English, for, for jobs uh, in that field? Well, yeah, and um, again, uh, financing things, it's not easy. Yeah. And um, I remember when I when I was doing my own doctoral project, which I failed. I non read the doctor doctor person. Yeah. I did astrology in law and um, six years in in Hanover. And I realized when I was dealing with the people of the philosophy of science department, they had to write the applications for grants all the time. They were self financing more or less their job. Is that what you would have to do yourself as well to to get a to to applicate? By some organizations that in your university the money goes to diversity to pay your salaries that's the same thing. yeah exactly in, in the uh, case of portugal we have an organization that oversees yeah. all that kind of grant and of course the places are limited yeah that's um, like the german uh, research uh, association deutsche forschung that's yeah same. it's a okay in, in one in one email you mentioned you have been in frankfurt recently astrologically or uh, academically academically what was it? What what did you attend in? There was a, a, a small workshop uh, organized by a colleague at the um, the Goethe University uh, in Frankfurt on um, religion and um, and astrology. So was so, it religious science professor who organized it? He, she's an historian of religion. A oh, historian of religion. So religious science, basically the department. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And who was there? Well, several. That was a uh, like uh, an internal thing. Well, no, it was not truly internal. But it was from for the academics um, to hear about this kind of discussions. And, Why did you go? Well, I was talking about um, the prohibitions of astrology. So, uh, oh, you were I, you were a lecturer. Yeah, I was. A you lecturer. were invited, yeah. and how did they get to know you? To invite you. Through papers and through uh, to exchange, um, oh, okay. you know, I've wrote a lot because of the Jesuits. I've been writing a lot yeah. on on religion and astrology yeah. in the early modern yeah. period, okay. which is, let's say, the the hot spot, you know, for those collision that collision. Uh, and um, so, so I was invited because of that. Oh, uh, that's that reminds me of Koko von Stuckart when he was invited to Freiburg with the Bender Institute to present his neo shamanistic studies. So basically, you're on the same track to to present yourself with papers and academic research, and people invite you. And uh, in the end, he ended up in in Amsterdam and later in the University of Groningen and with religious science. This is probably that's your hope, I suppose. That would be that would be the greatest achievement. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the idea is always to research, to produce proper research. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, uh, if you have the fund for it, it's wonderful. Yeah. And now looking back on your second uh, foot, which is the, uh, the school, the headmaster role, um, 
how much time is for the school? How much time is for the research, for the academic part? Well, it depends on responsibilities. If I have um, responsibilities or a research contract with the university, then the university comes takes, first. Comes first. Uh, mm -hmm. If I don't, uh, uh, then the school will be the um, point. Uh, well, I'll try to keep the two running yeah. in any case. Yeah, okay. Now, this balancing academic rigor and astrological school, did it change your character in relation to astrology that you did this academic path, that you are now a PhD and uh, an awarded PhD graduate? Did that change you, this academic experience in relation to what you do, what, what your school headmaster function is? Mm. Not really. Uh, the school always started with a sort of academic modeling of the teaching oh, of astrology, you know. Okay. So I'm always in. We always um, um, inspired people to look at the sources, to know how to not only just the technique, but look at the sources. Be critical about astrology because it's something that lacks tremendously yeah. today. You know, be critical, you know, does this work? Does this technique make sense? Uh, in a sense, is it aligned? Uh, does it produce results? And then I think that's a very important. So it, it didn't really change me. Um, at one point, Elena and I decided to go into academics and, and that conference in 2004 was a um, sort of a shifting point in that process. Um, because we wanted to write things that had substance. Um, because writing about astrology, you can produce a lot of good work. And I, I, I think I have at least made my effort to produce good work on astrology. Um, but you're writing to a public uh, which accepts everything. Yes. And unfortunately, the, 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 the astrological public and community are very... Um, What's the word? Um, permissive towards like, towards any form of astrology or uh, yeah. there's no anything. Criticism. Anything goes. Anything goes exactly. It's an anything goes attitude. And now um, let, let let me pause here. Philosophy of science. Do, are you familiar with Paul Feyerabend? A little bit. So you know that his metaphor is anything goes, mm -hmm. and it yeah. would be easier for you to get grants if he would be the dominating figure in the grant grant administration <laughs> okay that was just an uh, uh, i interrupted you <laughs> okay continue yeah but so so we decided to do something to produce more um solid work you know and um and we were interested you know in, in astrology not only by its practice but also his history you know where does these thing where these ideas come from uh, how do they develop in time because that has always been our um, our posture towards astrology, and that the academia allowed that. Um, so from a very early early point, we we started to model uh, our courses uh, as something we were teaching. I remember that a little bit before Elena and went into the, the her her course, we were teaching a course that we haven't done many times, which is. Um, which was at the time astrological culture. So a small course and where you're introduced to history, lines of thinking, you know, philosophies within astrology. So you can navigate it and we don't have that out there in the wild. You know, people accept everything without criticism, without peer reviewing. We don't really, I have, I have yeah. said this, I know for with the for I discussed this several times with some colleagues who are being one of them, that one of the problems that we do not have peer reviewing. And criti all. critical thinking is missing. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's even this thing you cannot criticize other people's work. Now, yes, you can. You, yeah, you, you, you I don't realize have that to you are <laughs> you you're very fond of peer reviewing. And I realized it in all the videos I was watching about with other people you have. I'm a little bit skeptic about the the, the the reality in the university. I think there's a lot of peer reviewing corruption corrupt corruption going on. How is your view on the problem of corruption in the peer review process? Well, um, 
you are in university, so you know what I mean. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. You know, there's always problems. You know, there is always problems. You can always have people cheating the system, and you do. Um, and then sometimes you have a very light peer reviewing that occurs, but it is needed. Okay. And uh, I, I myself, you know, I've been so everything that I published academic has been peer reviewed. Uh, and with the peer review process, especially a good or proper one, which most of the times it is. So um, you were lucky. You didn't have any problems with this dark side of the peer review problem. No, no. I think that is more towards the the sciences and yeah. the technology yeah. bits. Yeah. You know, that that's where where, where the dark side is. Where the money more. is rolling. Yeah, the patents in, in, in are where the patents where the patents are waiting. Yeah, in yeah. in humanities, particularly history. Why you know well, you're not should, going to get yeah. you probably should, yeah okay. Yeah, you will have problems with egos and people opinions and people trying to move the topic into their perspective instead of accepting yours. And sometimes you have that struggle yeah, uh, yeah. occasionally. Um, but I usually I'm, I'm I I don't have a problem with peer review. Okay. You know? and, okay. And and it's good. Uh, you know, sometimes you get a peer reviewer that doesn't agree with you and can be a bit nasty, but you still can learn from it. Okay. Because sometimes you can understand things like you're not giving enough substance to your argument for it to hold. And those people will say, okay. you, need, you don't, you have to prove this. You need to explain this. There's no, and this is good. Okay. And this is a good thing. And I think we should have it in all fields and especially astrology. Within astrology, and I'm talking about not something outside astrology, but astrology being self-critical of itself it would be good as well i think now, it's a good thing. going back to your academic part of your life um, mm. you are familiar with the work of shlomo sela and his, yes. his his editing of abraham ibn ezra yes did you read them uh, not all of them but i've 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 um I've researched through them a lot. I don't, were, they, were they an important input for your academic part of your life? Oh, did yes. you learn? Did you learn things you hadn't expected to learn? Yeah. So, yeah. elaborate. Well, um, what Shlomo Sala produced and and gives us is a good critical edition, a good edition of. Um, a very influential figure, which is Abraham Nezra, is very influential, especially towards my, uh, my late medieval and uh, uh, Renaissance early modern uh, period. You know, because he is quoted a lot, so it's good to understand how he is picking up the tradition before him and passing it on to the next. That is quite interesting to understand how certain developments. Of astrology take place and that's and that uh, goes right into your ad astra project to find out how techniques in traditional astrology since the hellenistic times changed it during history and uh, who were the people who were responsible for the changes do you have the the impression that ibn ezra is uh, one of the changes or is he just reporting mm. I think he's basically reporting. Okay. Because he, he states his opinion very clearly when he has one to give. Um so would you, you be, would you be able um I have the same feeling that he's a reporter and not changing them strongly. Um would you would you agree with me that it would be possible to take the literature of Ibn Ezra and take it as a basis for an astrology education in traditional astrology. Not going back to the Hellenistic texts, but taking Ibn Ezra and only Ibn Ezra, and that's good enough. It would make a large sum of it, yes. It would work, you mean? It would work. It would work. I think you always need input from other sources. Yeah, okay. But you could base a course on just Ibn Ezra. Yes, you could. Okay. Um, Shlomo Sela was involved with um, other people. I think David Just was part of it in the in the in the horoscope of Henry Paté of Mengelen. Do you know mm -hmm. that book? Yeah, I, I, know. Yeah, I know. What's What's your impression of the figure Henry Paté? 
What do you know about him? Can you tell our listeners what you know about Henry Bati? Well, I'm not that familiar with the detail, the historical details. You know, I've I've went through that book a long, long time ago. Um, but he's one of those figures of the of the Renaissance that are interested in astrology, are translating astrology, are are and are producing their own materials, their own notes, their own horoscopes, and and that is was quite common. And um, his is one of the surviving records we have. But um, we have a lot of people doing that. We have a lot of very interesting figures, most of them unknown, um, that were studying astrology, uh, were translating to Latin from sources or asking people to translate. And, and that is a, that shows the importance of certain texts and certain astrological materials. And I think he he's a, um, a good example of that. Later looking, on, looking for at... example, in Portugal, we find people translating texts from Latin to Portuguese. You know, as as the the Latin knowledge comes out of fashion, and you, people don't have the education to know enough Latin to read a source in Latin, they would ask people who were Latinists or who had the education in Latin to traduce to translate to 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 the to the Portuguese language. Um, text in Latin, and you see that in Spain, and you see that in other, in other uh, regions as well. So there's this interest, certainly, in being able to read as we have today in reading sources written in languages which we do not, um, we don't, we do not uh, dominate. You know, we don't have it. Um, I know that that Elena had to learn, had to be fluent in Latin, right? Yes. How about yourself? Um, I wouldn't say I'm fluent. I'm not a Latinist, but I I know enough to. So you could read the edition of Henry Bate of his of his horoscope. For the viewers, yeah. Henry Bate is is famous because he was a practicing astrologer and a clerical man in the Catholic Church, and he produced in the twelve hundred eighties, I think twelve eighty six or something. He he wrote down his own by astrological horoscope delineation. Uh, I'm not sure whether it was for an application for a new post or something, but anyways, he wrote it down in a manuscript. Uh, how how he delineate how in this manuscript we we could learn if we could read Latin, which I can't. Uh, you could read in, with your Latin knowledge. You could read the delineation text and the methods he was using in the delineation. And were you convinced when you read it that he was doing? Good traditional astrology. Yeah, yeah, he's doing the standard. So basically, it's it's a document which should be available in English. Yes, and they still haven't managed to translate it from Latin into English. The, 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 the <laughs> surrounding the surrounding text is in English, but the the the, the core yeah, 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 is yeah, still in Latin. You it's a lot of work, and and yeah. you know, there are more examples. You know, all delineations are good. Um, are good documents to have. I, I've always said yeah. this. Uh, as an historian, they're extremely interesting because they are a direct application of the method and is a testimony of how the methods are applied. For an astrologer, now shifting to, to, to the astrological thing, if you're studying astrological the astrological tradition, those is those kinds of documents is where you learn the most because people get stuck discussing theory. Yeah. 99% of the material we have are theoretical books. Even Manuals, the examples yeah. they give are very theoretical. They're very fashioned for that thing. They're, they're not complete. Um, so we learn the, ba the theoretical basis. But what they do in theory and what they do in practice is very different. Yes. And you, you got, oh, but how do they apply this? Perhaps they don't apply it like That's that. That's why I'm doing this project of today. Let people see how they do it. Mm -hmm. Instead of just reading the books of Chris Brennan, Veselensic Astrology, Dimitra George, Heavenly Spheres, where is the information how they do it? And if the historians in, in 4000 4, uh, want to know what you did, you haven't produced it because you're not going public with it, or you're not producing a book about it. <laughs> yeah, well. Okay. The focus of Elena's and your work is 
to look as a science person, as a his historian of history of astrology, how the techniques developed. You are not interested in how the manuals of astrology developed. You are interested in how the techniques developed, which is a very niche focus. If you look back to your academic career, is there a special, really great highlight you remember in doing this academic work? I remember Elena and the and the story when the second manuscript was found in London when David Juice was there on the Christmas party of the war work, and suddenly Elena had a second manuscript. Did you have something like that? This big highlight. Oh, this is great. I'm at the right place at the right time. Well, um, oh, sorry. You have always those little moments. Um, I studied a manuscript which was in the in the British Library. Uh, which is a set of uh, miscellaneous of several documents pertaining to Jesuit teaching of mathematics, astronomy, astrology, uh, which ended up for some reason in at the British Library. Uh, and it's the only manuscript uh, of that period. And that had the always attribute to a certain author. And when I was studying it, um, there was something a bit off. And um, the, there is three copies of the same text. And you, you start to realize that there's one of the copies which is annot annotated and where entire paragraphs and sentences are scratched out and then put into a different uh, way. And then in the other two copies, it's not, um, it's already corrected. So that means usually that probably you're looking at the original where the author, you know, did these annotations before having the final text. And that is uh, uh, a big moment. And suddenly there was a folio quite discreet in the middle of several others. And this is a huge volume where at the corner he had the, um, the basis of the, of the course. So he wrote something like, um, I will start by teaching the signs and then the planets and then the houses and then talk about the power of the fixed stars. And, and so he had, you know, like you would do in a napkin, you know, at the corner of a, uh, of a piece of paper, he had delineated the, um, the basis for the course that you are seeing complete early on in, in that volume. And that is a very interesting moment. And So, so basically, uh, I'm not going to compare that, but you had an experience like that and the same library, the British library, Wilhelm Gundel found the Liber Hermetis in a in a hidden text as well. Okay, yeah. this was the highlight. What was one the, of them? <laughs> and you had a small highlight like that. Was there a very big frustration in your academic work? You remember where well, you were really frustrated? Jesus Christ! I give it up. This is just too awful. <laughs> No, not not that to that to that point of quitting, but uh, sometimes you cannot access certain manuscripts. Okay, well that's not um, okay. Yeah, uh, for several reasons. That's that's uh, let's say every day is frustration. I'm looking at uh, something special. Any anything yeah. special? No. Well, you were lucky. Um, you were lucky. The big frustration didn't didn't reach to you. No, not 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 big enough to 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 make me quit. But it's always frustrating not to know um, things for certain. You know, okay. you 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 yeah. always get there are arguments where you you do your hypothesis and you're always hanging. You don't have the final yeah. proof yeah, okay. of it, um, but you have to learn with it. <laughs> okay, foundation of your work in the astro astrological field um, in the Hellenistic times, the practicing astrologers were sort of philosophically orientated, either hermetic or Stoic or Platonists, mm. let's say that's probably right, and and some mixtures of all the three. What about yourself? What's your philosophy? I wouldn't know how to classify it, uh, really. Um, I'm very, I'm very. <laughs> you are I'm not a her you are not a hermetist. I, I not not a not a hermet hermeticist guy. Mm. I believe. No, not really. I'm a, I'm very pragmatic in my approach to things. So okay. when it works, it works, and that's good enough for you. Yeah, you don't. I don't you, I, 
you I don't, don't need, need you, why you, it works. You don't need the this the god level of the eighth and ninth level of uh, of the of the Hermes philosophy. You don't need that for your for your foundation of what you're doing. Or do no. you have do you have a? I, I suppose you're probably Catholic, Portuguese, probably. Well, I'm. I'm not Catholic. Uh, I oh. do live in a Catholic back background. Uh, oh, you haven't been Catholic at all, ever? How did that come about? Because you are a Catholic country. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not in a religious family. My family is not that. Oh, religious. your family didn't force so you not... to, to go to church. Okay. Yeah, so from my generation, no one is baptized. A any so. alternative you apply? I, I was 22 years in a Rosicrucian uh, Context. Well, I, I studied esotericism, several stuff on eso esotericism, of course, uh, but there's nothing I I can't say I'm in this line or in oh. that line. I became, with astrology, I became very pragmatical, you know. Okay. Um, so you didn't study the philosophers like uh, the Neoplatonists, like uh, Protinus, uh, Porphyrius, and, and Proclus, or or you didn't you didn't interest yourself about what philosophy was behind Kepler or something like that? Well, it's always interesting, and I do like to know, uh, and I do like to read their points of view. But um, that's okay. that is not the that's more informative. That... That's not that's not founding you. Yeah, well, the the founding element there is, if we can put it like this, is. The way that you verify how, how all this geometry of the planets, in the case with astrology and all this geometry, that's the best word I have to say, works and how it moves things around and how it exists and how it is. I think that's more okay. my kind of line of... Coming back to your headmaster role and, and teaching astrology, your courses are 15 people, something like that? 15 sometimes 30 depends on 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 the years and you have them both live and online right i had them both live and online at, at this point i'm just doing them online uh, oh because, you you are you are now shifting to online yes because what happened with the online uh, was that uh the in presence um well, if, you're, if you're doing simultaneous online and in presence, the quality of the transmission is not as good as the, this one that we have here right now for those who are online. And uh, with when we, we went with COVID to full online, what happened is suddenly people who are outside of Lisbon, outside of Portugal, and who want to enroll in the course, they can. Um, and how, how is your clientele now? Uh, how much how, how much percentage is Portuguese online and how much is outside Portugal? Well, the, the majority is Portuguese, I would say. Oh, still, majority. okay. Still. And you're teaching, I, you're, you're teaching in English? The online. I'm teaching in Portuguese and in English. Oh, you have an online so, course in Portuguese? Yeah, so, okay. so the site the site that you showed is the, the English site. Yeah. There is an equivalent in, in Portuguese as well. Yes, yes. And you have these these modules. Uh, you have the traditional course. Now let's get into the details of what people are learning. Um, from start to finish, on your site, there are a lot of modules. There are present ones and old ones. Are the old ones active? Do you use them, or is it just a reminis reminiscent? It's just a reminiscent, and it will they will disappear eventually. Okay, but I keep them available to people to review the course as long as I can. Um, oh, the people who had them can still uh, uh, get into them, but I, as a new one, couldn't go into the old modules. Well, you could if you wanted to, but uh, you will not have the. But I have active modules where you can have yeah, the, okay. the, direct the interaction teaching. is only only with the with the active yeah. module. Now, I don't like um, video only based teaching. Okay. You no, know, there are some people who, by by time by time zones or, or by by their work, they, they cannot be at the classes, so they will do it. They will uh, watch it later, and it's okay. And people have been used to doing that for quite some times. But I like to talk to an audience, have questions. So, so basically, basically, your online course is a is a is an online presence course. You have exactly. it's it's a live course. It's a live course. Yeah. You have you have to be there in the chat room live if you want to participate in that course yeah, exactly 
So the traditional course of astrology is how how long or how much time consuming is it for the student? Well, it's still it's still being the English version is still being uh, thought out uh, because I've been adapting my course in Portuguese, which is the main one. Yes, is for two years weekly, one class weekly. Oh, I have to be present online for two years. That's yeah. that's uh, demanding. Okay. Yeah, it it had been it, it and it was larger at 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 uh, some point, um, because that will include the the basics, all the basic principles, all the bases of the lineation, and it's interactive. All the... It's all the time interactive, like yeah. in a in a virtual um, university. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, then it have the advanced delineation, the predictive techniques, and then working example. The last months are working example charts. So that's two years. Them. That's the two years. Yeah. And how much money would a student have given to you if he put the whole thing, whole two, th two years? I would think around... 1,000 something euros for the, the whole thing. That's moderate. That's not expensive. No, I'm not. You should you should promote your English version because you would be a very bad competitor for the high-priced people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I'm thinking of, of um, uh, re-adapting my courses to, to this um, structure. I've been yeah. very modular with English because people are not... Do not want to be two years, you know, learning something. But yeah, that, that's, really that's want... a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, but if you really want to study a subject and master it, uh, you have to go to your energy life. So you have to be there present as well. You have to invest on it. Yeah. You know, you have yeah, to invest okay. some yeah, time okay. on it. And I think you know, two hours per week is quite good. It should be okay. Yeah. okay. It's not that demanding. If you compare your two years. With the certificate and the diploma course of Robert Zola, is that a, a, approximately the amount, the, the same amount of content? Probably. Okay. okay. So you are a follow up on Robert Zola's course, except that you have a life situation. Because yeah, Zola, well, I, Zola, I was, Zola was obviously not, not a life situation. A virtual no, it life wasn't. Situation. Um, I don't follow his module of course the, the yeah, that's, that's for sure. yeah. um but uh, well the topics are the to are the same you know any course on astrology so basically you would say your topics. diploma your your aim is to have the same diploma level as the diploma level of robert zola's course yeah and i think i must say a better because i try to be present yeah, okay. Yeah. I you know, yeah. we do something he couldn't yeah. okay. for several reasons, for technical reasons, practical reasons, and because of his health. Yeah. He couldn't be, he... In one of your videos there was the there was um, there was the subject glossary book. Is that still in the making? Yeah. When will we have it? I, I remember Bruno Bruno Huber started the same thing in German and he didn't finish it. It's a, it's complex. Yeah. It's complex. And it's it's never going to be finished. It's never There's been. always something. That, that's, that's a problem with glossaries. It's never finished. Will it, will it be a print version or an online version? I'm still deciding that. I would like to have a print version. Okay. Very good. I would like to have so a print Don't version. forget to tell me when it's available in English, please. Because we don't it will be. A, it is being written in English directly. It's not being Oh, okay. Directly. Now, um, the, the, the subject of your academic work the development of the traditional astro astrological techniques over time. When you were talking with Michael Bryan uh, of the Oraculus podcast, mm -hmm. you were talking about combustion as, a, as one example, how it changed and how people misunderstand it. Mm -hmm. If you had to choose the three most misunderstood techniques today because of this development in history, what would the, these three most misunderstood techniques be? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Where you are mostly frustrated that people don't get it. Oh, I think the delineation process itself. Okay, that's one. I understand that. Process. People people tend to go to planets in signs still. Even the, and I'm talking about traditionalists. I'm not even yeah. talking about 
the more the modern line yeah. because when I'm talking sign, yeah yeah i i i mean i'm i'm in contact with people learning from the so, so basically you would also say people uh, are wrong not to using the terms right yeah and one of the most annoying things for me at this point i think it's sun sign the sun okay. sign that idea that the sun is an essential point to interpret in a natal chart whereas the ascendant is the main the ascendant is okay. the main point, and I and I okay. hear my colleagues constantly following that same uh, error and giving so much importance to sun signs. Yes, okay. Sun signs do not really matter. So that that's the second, the third one. The Take third you, one. You are frustrated uh, at limit at limiting. Well, essential essential conditions of the planets, I think. Okay. I, essential, no, not essential, es, es, sorry. Dignities. No, essential and accidental. The conditions yeah, of the planets yeah, in general. Yeah, the, um, I dignities. Think people, you, you're talking about dignities. Dignities in general, yes. Yeah. Um, from 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 the dignities themselves, to exaltation, triplicity, etc., to the um, oriental, occidental, superior, etc. I think people make... And sect is missing nowadays completely. Yeah, it, it's... Um, People forget that these things are, how can I put it? I was discussing this uh, earlier, yesterday with my students. Um, these are things that you add to the base interpretation. They do not become the interpretation itself. And people tend, when you're learning, you need to know the definition of these things, identify it, know how to interpret, that's okay. That's that's the the process of learning. So in your in your approach, dignities is not central. They are central, but they are not the starting point. They they are just telling you in more information on things. Okay, um, okay. I, I get you. See, okay. Okay. Um, if you don't have the initial sentence, astrological sentence, properly done that is going to add more confusion to it. So if you do the ascendant with all these facets correctly, then the dignity is supplemented. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. It is I the problem understand. of signification. Yeah. Okay. If you don't now, give a signification to the planets, you're going to have a hard time trying to understand, oh, but this, uh, my God, say, this Venus is oriental uh, and, um, I don't know, in high ease. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It only means with when you give that Venus a signification. Yeah. If you don't give the planet a signification, you're working on nothing. It's just I mean, theoretical that, concepts and possibilities. That was that was in your in your text in the in the first edition of the traditional journal, um, which gives me an opportunity for another question. We have this problem of assigning points in tradition, right? Mm. You are calculating this, this uh, aspect as six points, this is five points, this is three points, and then we add them all up to come up with the, with the sum. I have a problem with that, me personally, mm. not being representative. What do you think is the advantage of giving those points instead of trying to get the meaning of these as different factors without using mathematical addition. Well, let me, make, let me make a comparison. When you're doing your cooking and you're making a dish for the first time, you need to follow the recipe with I those agree. exact amounts. Yes. So, and once you've done it, I don't know, three, four, five times, you get your hang of it, you put a little bit more oh, of that. A little bit. Okay. And so, that counting, special the essential dignities, the essential, I think it's important, serve as a reminder that there's a hierarchy of power between those those um, those concepts. And those things have a certain degree. And that's a, as there's a degree of power there. And the best way of measuring it is mathematical. That does need you need to follow it rigidly. But not to follow it rigidly needs experience. 
Okay. And my problem with people nowadays, they have they they very quickly have opinions on that, without really testing that out and having I don't know ten years of practice of true practice of dignities to to sustain that kind of hand free hands free uh, measuring of things, um, which you can do, but you know you don't do that with one or two years of astrology. You okay, do that with yeah. 10 years of astrology and people forget time and experience okay. and have these very lofty opinions about how dignity should be counted or not counted. But everything that is mathematical is trying to give you a quantity. So it's trying to quantify something that is important with the central dignities. There is a, a quantity there as well. It's not just that. It goes beyond that, clearly. It is a quality as well, but you still, it would still be useful to, to, to apply that quantity. When it comes to a later period, when they are also attempting to quantify um, the accidental dignities, then it gets a bit more complicated. Okay. Because you can, there's not, the fact is that historically there is not one complete system for the sense so for the accidental dignities there there are several attempts at doing that um and it can be a bit more dangerous but still my students who decide to do the whole table and do the 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 the, the numbers what what good thing that comes out of it is that they already know the conditions of the planets you know they get the mastery of the chart and that is also another problem today you get everything too ready on the computer and once you get too ready on the computer, you have no mastery of the chart, whatever. You see? Because you're not working the chart properly from the beginning. Yes, yes okay. Yeah? And I'm not saying that people would have to calculate it by hand. I don't do it myself. But if we did, by the time we would have the chart drawn, you would have already have a lot of information that would be valuable yes. for the interpretation, yes. which yes. you get you lose. And especially when you start having programs that do all the computations, they, they sell you the dignities, they are calculating eye legs now, they are calculating that. That's not something a computer can do. And people I've seen professionally is following that mistake as well, of thinking that, oh, Solify says my he leg is this one. Yeah, yeah, but that's not how you do it. Do you use a computer program? Yeah, I use, uh, I use Solar Fire and Janus. Okay. When your students are in the course, two years of collaboration, you meet in the virtual life situation, you get to know your students. What are the present day problems, the highest problems for students of today in your course? What's your what's your impression? What what makes them the most difficulties? Hmm. Well, I think it's still this, let me see, a number of years ago, the main problem was that people were confused okay. with astrology. This before the tradition became a thing. People were hearing a lot of opinions from various peoples, most of them with no source at all, you know. People would hear a lot of opinions and have all these wonderful, fabulous ideas about spirituality, psychology, uh, healing, whatever, and had no idea how to pick up a chart and read it. Yes. And it would be a mess. There would be an unstructured thing. Then the tradition came. And one of the good things of the tradition is that it has a backbone, and you, which is the same throughout the ages, and you can rely on it as your basis. And that served for a time to structure an approach to astrology. You know, you would have that, that good root on which you could um, find your support to, 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 for your delineation. And now I keep finding the, the, the same confusion I would, found, I would find 20 years ago in astrology students is now popping up in traditional students. And I'm talking about people who have come into astrology through the tradition directly. Because you have Hellenistic and you have um, uh, medieval and people manage to pick up what is a whole system and fragment it in little 
bits and pieces, then they cannot make them work because they're always contradicting themselves. So they should, so only, they should only read Ibn Ezra probably and then not no confusion comes along. Yeah, that is a problem. It is a problem of a lack of a system. You, de you need a system where you can contain your knowledge and your learning. Mm -hmm. Once you have that system in place and you trust it because you have practiced and you have, you know, you have your own feedback of how the system operates, then you can look at the context and, and start, you know, perhaps picking a variation and said, oh, I think this author might be correct about that that topic so i'll adjust how do you how do you approach that problem with your students do you tell them don't read that don't read that just stay in the course and don't read anything else yeah okay strict yeah. you're strict yeah. on that okay yeah no well not strict people are free to do whatever they want but you <laughs> wouldn't you, would, you, would, you wouldn't allow you wouldn't allow the situation in your in your virtual life situation that somebody comes in with an information which doesn't belong to your system, say so that's off topic. No, we don't discuss it here. No, I will discuss it. Oh, you, you will? Know? Okay. And I will explain why. If is it that different and what's the difference? I'm not okay. um okay. I don't I don't run a <laughs> okay, let's 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 boarding let's school. Put, uh, um for that simu let's, si let's simulate a situation. <laughs> I would be a student in your course, okay? And you you were teaching house system. You use Alcabicius houses. And I said, why don't you use whole sign houses? Isn't that better? That would be my student question. What would you say? Oh, I say what I usually say. You know, I do not give the whole house system enough uh, sensitivity or, um, let's say, uh, accuracy that uh, an, uh, another quadrant system has. In what in in what areas are the accuracy de, uh, deficit here? Where, where, where well, do you, you don't you don't have house cusps. That's the starting point. That's the starting point. That's true. And house cusps do give more uh, substance and and more shading to to the whole process. Okay. You know. Um, but if you take the ascendant, okay, which is seventy percent of the chart, mm -hmm. that could be done with the whole sign system. Then, in your opinion. Well, depends. Okay, elaborate. Let's say that you have, <laughs> let's say that you have a an ascendant at twenty seven degrees of a sign. Mm -hmm. Let's say Gemini. Okay. Uh, and there's a planet in Cancer close enough to that ascendant so that it is an angular planet of the first house in a uh, quadrant system, but it would not be. It would be a second house planet in uh, a whole sign house. That's true. Yeah. Okay. And, and these are special cases. What about the not so special cases? Well, when you look, when we're talking generic, there are charts where there's no real difference. Right. Okay. But so ba basically, right. basically your argument is in a quadrant uh, system like Alcabicius, we need the Alcabicius for these situations. And if we don't have these situations for the ascendant problem, the whole sign system would, would suffice. Well, what happens throughout history is that all the, 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 all the testimonies that exist on, on practicing astrology, they always say, Things which are more less accurate mathematically can work for generic things. Yes. But if you want specificity and precision, you need the mathematics, you need mathematics. involved. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the the attitude that I see in all astrologers of the past. Do, do your students, uh, as you mentioned in with Chris Brennan's video, um, you, you teach um, calculating the chart, right? By hand and with the, with the computer for the uh, for the mathematical process, do your students have problems with that? People are very resistant, are very afraid of mathematics. Yeah. I think that's a unfortunately a cultural thing. Um, but I, I I do want them to at least once in their life calculate the chart with the tables. Yeah. Okay. You know, okay. it's not that difficult. I think people you know make a whole lot of a big problem okay. out of nothing. Yeah. 
Um, in, Ger in Germany, for the diploma of the German Association, the Deutsche Astrologenverband, you have to write a thesis, a long thesis. Uh, what about your course? Do you write a, th a long thesis? You need to present a, um, a research uh, on a chart, to, let's say, sort of a thesis. Not a the I wouldn't call it a thesis, but a large report at the end. Yes. Is it a delineation text uh, where they have to delineate a chart? Yeah. How many pages? 30 pages at least? No, not that big. Not okay. that big. Okay. It's a small, small text. Okay. Yeah. By the time, because I'm I'm dealing with the students directly, uh, most of the time I know what, what they are able of. Okay. What they are capable of doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um one interesting problem in traditional astrology is some people say you can't find the soul in the chart. Hmm. Um Stephen Birchfield in, in Norway, in his course talks about the quality of the soul in the chart. Mm. What's your opinion? Can you find the qualities of the soul in the chart, especially in the ascendant area? Yeah, but the soul there is not the soul in the same, in the same sense as the modern esoterics have it. Okay. Soul there, that comes from Ptolemy. And soul there is, the word he's using is psyche. So yeah. actually those are the significators of psyche. So of the mind, of the psychology of the individual. They're not exactly the soul in the same sense as, um, I don't know, um, an hermetic or a, um, a theosophist would say soul, which okay. is that which survives beyond the body. We're talking about the mind. Okay, so basically you're saying the subject of psychotherapists can be found in the chart, not the sole subject of the hermetic scriptures. Well, that's a philosophical debate. Yeah, is the soul right. in the chart or not? Well, it's yeah. a good question. I don't have an answer for it. <laughs> okay. Any any opinion? Does on the soul exist outside ourselves, yeah. or is the soul a sub? What we call the soul just a, a sub product of what yeah. we are? Yeah, yeah. And and it, it's the <laughs> neurocognition sciences. What is what is uh, conscience and what is matter? Uh, we are getting into into a deep yeah. deep, deep but, waters but, here. But what you find generally in any text that approach, and I, I'm not at all an expert on this, I haven't read everything, but what I have read so far is that when they go into that aspect, astrology is always a very material thing. So astrology is, is speaking, even in non-Christian contexts, uh, about the materiality of the body. So it's it's which your mean, material Which would condition. mean the first book of Cornelius Agrippa von Nettelsheim, the first book is on this level. And the second is on the celestial level, and the, and the third book is on the divine level in his three books of Occulta Philosophica, Philip Philosophia. So basically, you are saying astrology belongs only to the first book of the Occulta Philosophia of, of Onetosan and has nothing to do with the celestial and the divine spheres. Well, it is a celestial thing. So it, it, I, I wouldn't well, the put celestial, it in those, uh, I wouldn't there, put it in it, those particular boxes. You see. Uh, no, the, the box is different. Okay, my, my fault. The box is different. <laughs> uh, when he when Agrippa talks about celestial sphere, that's above uh, uh, above the moon. Yeah, and, and but moon. let's put it. Let me put it another way. Um, astrology is the interpretation of a specific moment in time and in a place uh, using the the heavens. The configuration of the heavens. Most of the people think about a human birth, but it can be an event, can yes. be something else. Yeah. You know? But let's say a human, but those events don't have soul in that same sense. So a human. So astrology pertains to that physical manifestation. Okay. In that context. Yeah. Okay. Does it have any spiritual contact? Well, it has, since one has a spirituality, and spirituality is part of one's existence. So there will be some spiritual content into astrological interpretation. But if you go more absolute into the nature of what a human being is, and if you think there is a spirit, something that is undying, supernatural, you know, eternal, that is manifesting through that event, is it on the chart? Probably not. It's open for discussion, okay. Yeah. yeah. Probably not, but again, yeah, this okay. depends on how you're you're yeah. approaching it philosophically. Okay. You are friends with Dorian Gisler Greenbaum, right? 
Yes, I am. You know her book, The Diamond. Yeah. Now that begs the question, what do you think of diamonds? Do they exist or do they not exist? As an entity, a spiritual entity, not materialized, obviously, but on the angel or higher levels, it could exist as an entity. What's your opinion on, on diamonds in well, today's time? Do thoughts have a life of their own? Do obsessions have a life of their own? Do tastes have a life of their own? Perhaps they do. They do exempt lives uh, of their own. So perhaps, I don't know exactly in what form they exist, but there is some kind of, let's say we are, we are physical, but we are also thought okay. because we think we produce thoughts. So you at, least, go, at you least some people do. <laughs> you wouldn't go as far as I would go that I have a guardian angel as an entity. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't go that far. Well, not so sure about Take, that. Taking angels as real is not your cup of tea. Not in the literal sense. People no, usually that, that's intend. what I mean. Okay. Um, when I was talking with Elena, we were talking about the archetypal philosophy of Carl Gustav Jung. And I am working on this problem, what is an archetype in the sense of Jung's psychology? Mm. And there are people who think that the archetypes are living entities, and there are people who say, no, they are not. What's your position there? I don't think I have one. Okay. It's not, some, not something I considered. No, it's not no problem. Yeah. Um, if you go into your academic field, looking at the old documents, which all the problems about documents, I believe they just violence the, 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 the first manuscript is from the 15th century, I believe. And there's nothing real before that. So we deduce from a paper of the 15th century something about somebody living in the second century. And the same seems to apply to Ptolemy as well. Now, if you take these traditions of documents and realizing that the real concrete document is very young and doesn't reflect what's really going on 800 years before that. Is there an author which you rely more than on other authors? For example, do you follow the opinion that Ptolemy is, is an idiot and Vegas Violence is the good guy? Do you have opinions like that? Not, not that uh, extreme. Um, and I wouldn't go for Vettius Valens. I would go for Dorotheos. Okay, as, so you as would prefer Dorotheos, okay. Yeah. So, uh, so we have one, Dorotheos, okay. Dorotheos, because um, let's say um, the problem with that dichotomy is not Ptolemy Vettius Valens. That's the thing that happened, started to happen three, five years ago. That discussion came up because I don't, I'm not sure, and I'm not an expert on this, um, Levente Lazo probably would answer this very well because it's his field of study. But Vetus Valens, although it is mentioned throughout the tradition, is not really one of the major sources. He's referred to, but as far as I know, most authors appear to refer it as a second-hand uh, reference. You know, <coughs> the part of marriage according to Vetus Valens. That's the one I remember at top. You know, um, so they've seen it. They've heard speak a bit, but I think very few people must have worked with Vettius Valens documents. Perhaps the Byzantine astrologers would have, because it's a Greek tradition. Abu uh, Marshal but... seems to have relied on Vettius Valens a bit. No, Do I remember that right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't okay. know. But okay, take Dorotheus, another one. But so Vetus Valens and Ptolemy are not yeah. Yeah, okay. the, the, the informants of the tradition. We, leave them, and we leave them fight somewhere else. What you take Dorotheus as a as a reliable foundation. Another person in history? Astrologer? Firmicus Maternus? No. No, not your company. No, no, Firmicus Maternus is a mess. So probably um, Arabic text, uh, Abu Mashar. Abu Mashar is nice. He's not the most organized of persons, but yes, it's his, he does a good job. Um, Abu Mashar is good. Um, Ali ben Rajal was a very important text yeah. for me. 
when I was constructing is, and is, learning. Is, Abi, is Ibn, is, is Ab, uh, Ibn Abib, Abib, Abib Ren Ben Rachel, is he translated into English? No. For our I viewers, for our viewers who can read German, the, the Abi Ben Rachel text is in a book in Germany. Ooh. And it's, it's, it's this thick. It's called Lehrbuch der Klassischen Astrologie by Rafael Gilbrandt, which is a Spanish guy. He participated in that research group in the, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And he produced a German book this thick and a second German this thick, Matrix, using Ben Rachel's text. Okay. Yeah, because who the, the person who did the research on, on that tradition was Gerald Hilty. He, I don't know if he, he's still alive. If, if he is, he's very old. Mm -hmm. He did the first edition from the Castilian version. Why, why did why did nobody put this into English? It's a lot of work in, invested and nobody uses it to translate it. Strange. Because okay. people have choices. Yeah. What, we don't have that many people translating. We have Ben Dykes, basically. Yeah. Uh, what's, your, people... what's your opinion on ben, Benjamin Dykes? Is he a good translator? I wouldn't know because I, I don't oh, okay. read Arabic, so I wouldn't okay. be able to judge that. Um, I do have an opinion on the way I think. Um, he some, view, so he reminds me some sometimes about he is a pupil of Robert Zola, and when he talks about the academic translators, he reminds me of so Robert Zola when he brushes them off. What do you think about that? Well, um, what I think about the translations is that uh, I think there's. Let's let me put this so I'm not misunderstood. I think we do have terminology for astro for astrological uh, techniques and methods, which is Western, which is English, because we're talking about translations to English, uh, which is English, and I think they are creating. There's a whole school of Ben Ben Dykes. I think it's, it's has been participating in that of creating new terminology which I think is completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't facilitate the reading of the texts. If you have to stop at every other word or every three or five words to understand, wait, wait, what is this? And I'm talking about people who understand the texts. I'm not talking about students who have never read an astrology text, especially an older one. Um, why are we making up new terminology when we know exactly how to translate, for example? Mm -hmm. He uses it. He uses to use the word stakes for the angles. Mm -hmm. Why, if we have the word angles, he can put a footnote. I would put a footnote. It's 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 it's, it's his translation. It's its work. It's his choices, of course. Um, but I would prefer to see that with the normal terminology, so that is readable. Instead of we having to have almost a glossary of terms to read a book that is not assisting the translation. And for example, if you read a trans an academic translation, for example, like Charles Burnett, you don't have that problem. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because the terminology is updated yeah. and it's fluent in the way you read it. And some of Ben's translations are not because he's choosing to keep a very old dated tradition, which sometimes I probably it's necessary because there's not an equivalent term, but a lot of that work can be solved with a footnote. You know, and you when you explain. Uh, here, this the, the the term is this one because of the context, the culture, the language, etc. Um, and I think that is getting the books difficult to read. Okay. It's not. It's not. Flu no, it's not a fluent reading. Yeah. That's my only thing to to point yeah. out. To point yeah, out. I, th I think you're right there. He probably has a. I'm sure he has a, a perfect explanation on his part why he chose to do it like that. That's that's a translator's prerogative to. to well, that's what Ibn Ezra had to do when he translated into Hebrew. He, then he invented new terms. Well, that might be correct because Arabic and Hebrew is a different is a different story than. Okay. Yeah. Um, in Hebrew, but in Hebrew they had a problem, uh, and I know that because I, I have I have been in projects. Uh, that studied Hebrew texts, technical texts. And that's a problem because if the word exists in Hebrew already, it's one thing. But if you're suddenly translating new knowledge produced in Latin, let's say, or in vernacular, and you want to trans to put it into Hebrew, 
they had a lot of problems because there were no words yeah. in Hebrew yeah. that would be equivalent. That's, or that's what speak. even Ezra had to solve. Yeah. Exactly. exactly. So they would have to create words yeah. or sometimes transliterate directly the, 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 the Latin word. Yeah. Whereas it, the Ben Dykes would have had a terminology available to him he didn't use. Okay. Yeah. But... Okay. It, you have a, a version against the term Renaissance. Could you... No, Renaissance is a very. You don't like you don't like the word Renaissance, right? No, no, because for example, to say that Lily is a Renaissance author historically is alt highly incorrect. You know, by the time of Lily, by the seventeenth century, Renaissance was done and over. Yes, we are in a completely different mindset. But I, I, I'm more interested in your opinion on. You don't like the term because it's so difficult to give a starting point, because we have Renaissance in Charles the Great in 800. Aspect. Well, the Renaissance, as it's put historically, the one we identify as the Renaissance, so the, the, the 15th century, late 14th, 1453 and onwards. Yeah. And onwards, yeah. that Italian movement, you know, yeah. the, the Greek, the beginning, yeah. that's a very specific point in time. You know, it's that period there. And sometimes it's also specific geographically. Yes. Because that's not going to occur yes. at the same time everywhere. So that cultural movement, which is very important and very, very key to understand that that historical period, is dated on those on that, at that time. Once you go into the 16th and 17th century, it's no longer really Renaissance. It moved yeah. beyond that. Yeah. It, that process has already. Yeah been incorporated and it's moving on from itself you know to other stuff you can see that in art for example yeah. you know you have the renaissance art and then it moves along along very then you have the baroque you know yes, so by the yes. by the time we're talking about all these authors william lilly uh the renaissance authors the cardano we're talking about the baroque we're not talking about the the the, the renaissance exactly as we would see yeah. Yeah. So it is a matter of terminology. So to to get to hit such a wide period, Renaissance is not really accurate. But it it is very debatable, even historically. When does a period end and starts? You know, yeah. how do where do you consider it? As and as you pointed out, there are several Renaissances to consider. You have the Carolingian Renaissance, which we're pointing to. You have later on also the, the Renaissance of the 12th century with the translations of the uh, of works from Arabic to, to Latin and to, to Spanish. Yeah. So it there are several Renaissance, but the yeah. Renaissance is, I think, it's very allocated in time mm -hmm. and in geography. And by the time we reach the 16th and 17th century, and most of the time in astrology context, we're talking about 16th and 17th century yeah. authors. That's not like the Renaissance, truly. When you, studied the mid, when you studied medieval aspects, did you ever come about the 13th century with the guy called, his name was Hugo de Balma in Paris? Never? No, no I don't not think. Not something for you, okay. Um, no. The rational, rationalization of astrology is a topic, right? Mm -hmm. Could you tell us your position? Well, um, that is a um, a product of again of its own time. Um, I have a, a chapter in my in my in my thesis and in my future book dedicated on the mathematization of astrology, and other other authors have talked about this, in which you can see the uh, that and that comes with the early modern period. So fifteen. Onward, 15th century onwards, where you're trying to make things more scientific. So they are. I, th going... I think it started with with uh, the the the, uh, the approach to be more astute, uh, Aristotelian than Platonic in the Arabic times, and that's more. And then later on, it got more mathematic. But that I think the starting point is when the astrologers decided we want to be Aristotelian and not Platonic. Would you yeah, agree? well, I'm not sure if there's a point where someone says that. Um, uh, I think that's. Uh, I think that most astrologers, the practicing ones, are not going to debate if they're Platonic or Aristotelian. 
Oh, well, some, some, some confess I'm platonic. You can find Charles, yeah. Charles Orwood is one of those. He's... Yeah, but yeah. that's 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 the person's own philosophical posture, religious yeah, posture, yeah, etc. Yeah, you yeah, know, okay. most of us, most of the astrologers historically think thinking historically are concerned with practice. Yes, so they don't really are going to to be um, thinking about that in deep. You find that in other works. Which are reflecting upon astrology or what the nature of knowledge, etc. And then you have that kind of discussion. But I, I think the average astrologer wouldn't have oh, that kind okay. of uh, okay. discussion. Yeah. Like today. You know? Okay. I think my last question would be if you had the chance to organize a traditional astrology organization and you had you would have to decide which is allowed to enter hmm. what what people of today would come to mind who would be part of your new association oh, I, Sharon, not, Sharon Knight for example I'm not going to even go there <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't from the experience I have I wouldn't organize anything <laughs> okay now let, let's put it in other words um, do you have a network of people which are thinking like you Yes. How yes. many? Well, three or thirty. Well, I will more, more close to three than thirty. Okay. I think. So yes. basically, we have the situation that on your level, not that many people who can talk with you. In a sense, um, yeah, okay. For example, one of the things astrologically is that I don't use the new planets. Well, that's, now, that's understandable. That's, yeah, that's... And nowadays, yeah, and nowadays. Uh, not only there are more people using the new planets, yeah. um, and I've already seen and heard some criticism of our non-peer-reviewed uh, friends out there uh, accusing of fundamentalist people who, who don't use the, <laughs> the modern planets. Yeah, so that starts to be complicated. Uh, I don't usually bother people, you know, what, what they do or do not, even if I think they're, they're doing up something absolutely stupid and uh, nonsense. But um, what's, like what's the problem? Just... I, I mean, I know what the problem is, but our viewers might not know what the problem is. Uh, I, I can refer the viewers to this very interesting uh, podcast with Chris Brennan and Benjamin Dykes about Robert Soller. Uh, what is for our viewers now, we both know what we're talking about, why we shouldn't use the auto planets. What would you, if you would, if you would be invited to a public speak situation for people who don't know much about astrology or who are only psychological astrology, what would you tell them? What are they doing to the craft when they use the auto planets? Well, they're um, taking into consideration, they're assuming certain meanings and certain operative qualities that those planets are supposed to have, which are not really verified, right. are not acquired, and 90% of them or more are not acquired astrologically. They're acquired theoretically by thinking, if the world is pink, then my glasses are also, uh, stuff like that. And most of the, of the, of the way that their meaning is justified in us in modern astrology does not mix philosophically and ontologically with the tradition and people don't realize this Let and, me give you and if you use pluto saturn gets unemployed if you follow the reasoning yes but it doesn't so what's happening yeah, yeah, there yeah yeah yeah. Um, the thing is, and so you cannot you cannot choose one thing and the other at the same time. I always give this example with the asteroids. People who use the asteroids, at least the those the ones that are more loud in their use, assume that the, 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 the asteroid acquires meaning through the naming that it has. So, for example, and this I've seen this example around somewhere. Um, if the astero if the um, uh, asteroid was named Beer apparently there's one out there with that name, then it will mean 
beer or situ astrological things that are related to beer. If you assume that is correct, that philosophy of giving meanings to a celestial body is completely different from the, 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 the philosophy of giving meaning to celestial bodies that the tradition has. So you cannot put the two things together. It's olive oil and uh, and water. They don't mix. You cannot you cannot make coexist in the same practice systems which are incompatible uh, by nature, and people don't see this. And this extends to a lot of things. You know, um, I've seen traditionalists speaking about the signs. And then saying, but we shouldn't use the, the the zodiacal alphabet of sign equals house equals planet. But then they're attributing to that sign a lot of significations that are clearly coming from the house, which they erroneous supposedly correspond to, and not to the sign. So again, and it's very difficult. You know, I I I've passed through the process of stripping uh, myself as much as I could of what I've learned of modern to be able to fully understand the tradition. It's not an easy process, but yeah. nowadays we're seeing a mixture, which I think is extremely toxic to the tradition. And I think people have not realized how toxic it is. Yes. Okay. Before we come to the end, uh, uh, the copyright declaration, I have the right to publish this very, very nice in uh, talk with uh, Luis Ribera, uncut and unedited on my channel and my homepages, whereas Luis has the right to do whatever he wants to do with the footing. He can put a seven-minute video with music and pictures to do some public relation with it. So that's the copyright declarations. Did I miss to ask something important? Hmm. I don't know so many things we could talk about. Um, Should we talk about something I missed? Well, something well, we on your to... something uh, on your astrological heart side and something on your academic field heart side. Well, I can take I can take one that I've spoken to students this a lot, and this is an opportunity of speaking it a bit more publicly. Is that? Um, I have I've joined um, in myself two different perspectives, the one of the historian and the one of the astrologer, which, uh, as I told you uh, by email, I don't mix in the yes. sense that when I'm when I'm being an historian an historian of science, specifically an historian of astrology, I'm an historian. I'm not an astrologer. To keep things well separate, uh, um, one thing is to study a practice; the other thing is to do it. Uh, there might be interceptions and, and knowledge cross information of knowledge, but I keep them separately. Um, but nowadays, I think people are too much enamored with history of astrology in the astrological community. And although that's important, and I think people should know the history of, of astrology as much as they could, they forget that history is not practice. Knowing a lot of history of astrology is not the same as being a good practitioner of it. And uh, sometimes think, I think people get a little bit mixed in that in that sense. Um, you don't need to know history to practice astrology. You just know to need to know the system and know and attain the mastery required to to do it properly. Uh, you should know history. Yes, you should. It's culture that you should know. But one thing is not the same as the other. And I think people sometimes are mixing up discussions of history with discussions of astrology. And that can be very complicated. And it can it can and it can at some points, as I usually say, throw a wrench into the, the cogwheel. So you get stuck because you're discussing the history of a, a method instead of practicing it. And you shouldn't. You should practice it, see the results, test it extensively, and then you can discuss what is historically correct or more entitled with what you're observing the method to be uh, or how the method is operating and not the opposite. So um, this is my caveat, I would say, to to to, to students nowadays. 
So you take clients from all over the world if they pay the 80 euros. Yeah. What <laughs> astrology do you not offer? Do you do a mundane astrology with clients? No one has ever requested that it's. But you would you would do it if you if they would come. Yeah, in. I usually do mundane as a research for myself yeah. when I. And you could time. you could offer it to a president of the United States if you wanted to. Yeah, like I Ronald would. Reagan. I would do my best work. I always <laughs> say that. Well, uh, or we could we, we could we take might the, have specialties. We might we could have... use Elizabeth Tessier as an example, closer to home in President Mitterrand. Okay, you, you do <laughs> but I, I always think in that regard that. As an astrologer, you should you should know all the tools yes. that are available to you. You might be better at one or the other. You have more mm -hmm. expertise. You have more experience. In, for example, you can have more experience in natal astrology than you have on orary or elections, okay. Okay. or vice versa. But you should know them all, mundane included. Okay, when you when you do uh, when a client from Australia would would want to have an orary consultation. Mm. How would you deal with the technical problems, the place of the chart, the time of the chart? How would you solve that? No, the time of the chart, in the place is when I read it. and um... So, but when you read the email? Yeah. And it's, it's your, your place, Elizabeth? Yeah. Okay. So I have no more questions. I'm very glad that we did this. It was very nice of you to take your time. Thanks from the viewers and from myself to well, you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> I stopped the recording.